Tonight on History So It Doesn't Repeat, we discuss the history of Western culture with Kevin Cole, who explains the method of circular education which holds it all together. Though some call it schooling, it's always been about harnessing the mind to create human resources and perpetuate organic unity. Learning's the answer. What's the question? Here's your host and navigator, Richard Grove. It's time to study history so it doesn't repeat. Welcome back to History So It Doesn't Repeat. Tonight we're joined in studio by Kevin Cole. He's going to brief us on his research into the classical trivia method, uh, better known as uh, the liberal arts education method that spans several thousand years time, and learn how to contradistinct it, or to contrast it, better said, to contrast it, to the trivia method of critical thinking and creative problem solving. Kevin, welcome to the studio. Thanks for having me. How are you doing tonight? Good, how are you? Where would you want to start if you wanted to pick a starting point for the conversation? Before I get into my outline, I've got a hundred page outline that you've given me. I've got some questions, but if you had a choice on what you wanted to say first, uh, what would it be? Well, I'd just say that uh, I'm starting a book uh, entitled The Great Chain of Being and the Organic Unity of the Polis. And my purpose is to try to explore the concept of the trivium throughout history. The trivium being grammar, logic, and rhetoric, the first three of the seven liberal arts system. Now, I've been exposed to a methodology that has been permeated by Gino Denning and others online, which I found very fascinating. And I've sought to kind of research the etymology of the grammar, logic, and rhetoric used in a general fashion. And what I found was much different throughout history. So, all right, so that's a good, that's a good place where we can crack into uh, the folder here. And uh, let's start. So, uh, you're referring to the Gino Denning interview. That was October 25th, 2009. Our friend and colleague, Jan Irvin, had interviewed uh, a self-taught scholar named Gino Denning. It was published as episode 49 of the Gnostic Media podcast, found at GnosticMedia.com. The title of the interview was The Trivium Method, and uh, it's under the podcast on that navigation. Menu. Sure. I think that's where we all encountered it. And then from there, it's taken on a life of its own. And as you came across it, you heard some things that were very interesting. It was a good introductory to these subjects, mm -hmm. and you took the time to to dig deeper. So, what was that questioning process like? Like you first heard it, you found it useful enough to start looking into some of the history. What was the first thing that you found out about it, and where did that lead you? Well, when I first heard up, when I first heard it on the the podcast, uh, it was not something I had been exposed to. Uh, in the American education system. It's not something they necessarily taught in, in uh, grammar class or English class in high school or even in grade school. Now you do get the uh, general grammar and the how to make up sentences and syntax and, and this is very important. Vocabulary. In, voc vocabulary, because this is where it really starts in ancient Greece. It starts with the word. But when, when I heard about it being used as a critical thinking tool, I found that fascinating. And I went looking for the sources of who, were, who was putting out that information. But it, it was interesting to uh, see how this, this uh, had been kind of turned into a meme that could be applied to help people in their critical thinking. Now, as you said... Reasoning is important. Reasoning is important. And as you've said before, you know, we, we need a methodology in order to go through the world and find our place and find substance and truth amongst, you know, amongst a group or amongst the individual. Uh, but it was, it was fascinating to find out that the history of the classical trivium is much different. And it has a lot to do with closed systems, artificial scarcity, the great chain of being, and this concept of organic unity. Oh, these are some fascinating terms that I'm sure we'll become more acquainted with as you go on. So what you're doing is drawing the contrast from what you found through history of how the classical trivium was applied through society, mm -hmm. and you juxtapose that to how Gene is presenting it as a method of that's that's a you know kind of a set aside from dogma, and that the classical trivium you're hinting at has been used as some sort of dogmatic device throughout history, sure. useful in shaping culture. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, the great chain of being, I need to start with defining a couple yeah, of terms. Yeah, let's define some terms. All right. Well, the great chain of being is a concept that comes from Plato, and it's later perpetuated through Aristotle and Plotinus. Now, from the Blackwell Dictionary of Western Philosophy, we find that this idea of the great chain of being can be traced to Plato's division of the world into forms, which are full things and sensible things, which are imitations of forms and are both being and not being. Aristotle's teleology recognized a perfect being, and he arranged all animals by a single natural scale according to the degree and perfection of their souls. This idea of the great chain of being was fully developed in Neoplatonism throughout the Middle Ages. 
Now, the concept is responsible for the division of society in the Middle Ages into the three estates, with each relating to a hierarchy and a great chain of being. Is the fourth estate one of those estates? We'll get to that. Oh, yeah, I know. Because it all has to do with the concept of balanced government. Now, a lot of that comes, comes about later, but we're going to be talking about the sources of civil society itself. Well, before we get too deep into the history, I just want to observe, if you're talking about something that's 2,500 years old or older, how does that apply to us today? Well, it, it seems the educational philosophy has it has been in what John Taylor Gatto has described an ominous continuity for an twenty ominous for, continuity absolutely for, right. so for twenty one generations uh, we're going to find out what what education system has prevailed. Oh, fascinating! All right, so before we get into that, let's talk about this idea of plunder versus production that has gone on through history and how the trivium or the classical trivium rather has played into that uh, the, g gaining momentum as humanity has grown more civilized sure. through well, methods. We're, we're, all, we're obviously familiar with the concept of newspeak that H.G. Wells talks about in more modern times, where, where language can be used to control the masses. Now think about going back as far as ancient Greece, where certain classes weren't allowed to learn how to read, weren't allowed to learn how to reason in the public square, or Are to participate. About just slaves or common people? Or, sure, or what the, types of people weren't allowed to well, learn how to read? Or Well, anybody that was an outsider was considered to be a barbarian. And then you had the plebes, and then you had the warrior monks and the guardians, and you wanted each, each class to fulfill a specific function. So it, it's a stratified system that we're going to be talking about tonight. And I think that maybe answers your question. Well, I'm always interested in the stratification of history because that's how society has been formed up to this point. And it's through the history that's been passed down. And it's, it's through all the stories that have been deleted to make room for just that single thread of history that we've been presented as Western civilization. Yeah. Uh, deception and warfare, the occulting of knowledge to create power in society. How does that play into the, the early uh, cognition of these devices to control or manipulate the minds of others? Well, I mean, they say knowledge is power, right? So, I mean, it's who controls the knowledge controls the power. And if you can control what classes in society or those that you see as the dregs or those that you want to keep down, uh, you, can, you can control what type of material they have access to. And to an extent, you can measure the class stratification by the uh, dialect that one uses. And so by keeping the, the classics or the uh, Latin language classics that are told throughout history to help learn any language from certain classes in society, then you create people that have higher active literacy rates where they're able to go out and speak their mind on the subjects that they'd like to speak and you have they're others. They're more likely to get what they want. Exactly. Okay. How do you think the hiding of useful information from people, preventing them from making informed choices, transforms over 2,500 years and, and affects us today because what I see are a lot of people who are making choices and if they had this other piece of information, this neglected aspect, if you will, they would make a different choice. So how do you see that, that power pendulum swinging in the 21st century? Well, there's two different there's two different strains, and I hope to, we get to this even more later, but with, with the state system in the United States, that transcended or took place rather before the concept of, of romantic nationalism that develops out of the German idealistic movement and even earlier movements in Germany that we're both familiar with. So there's a, there's a contrast that has to be discussed between the traditional romantic nationalism and a limited government system where the government is supposed to be there to protect people from its own tyranny on the people. Right, and so we're that, no, that's we're, a great place. Let's dig into that ominous continuity and take it back into the city-states of Greece where the citizens and some, a lot, many of the ideas that we have prevalent in America today uh, took root. And then let's get into the, uh, the circular reasoning, the sure. circular education, the Ancyclos Paideia. Okay. Well, in order to get there, we'll, we'll finish up on the great chain of being. And as I said, this concept is responsible for the division of society during the Middle Ages into the three estates, each relating to the hierarchy of the great chain of being. The first estate was comprised of the church officials, for instance, the pope, the archbishops, bishops, and priests. The second estate was the ruling class, that would be the kings, the nobility, and the knights. Finally, the third or lower estate would consist of peasants and merchants. Now, this, this chain further divided medieval secular society and constitutes what we know as the divine right of kings. But it sounds like Plato's plagiarizing the caste system from India. 
or something before that with, that we've lost the history of. Yeah, and I and that's going to play a major role in in the research that I've I've brought forward is that the the solidification of the seven liberal arts system uh, is 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 an artificial scarcity on the knowledge that existed at the time. You know, there were there were grammaticos, there were other there were different individuals within society that would travel from Chaldea, from Egypt, and so on, and this got solidified into a system based on what used to be out in the public square. And and this is done by Isocrates, and we're going to get to him in just a minute ex after we explain some of the basic concepts of the polis and the polity. Were there a lot of women that were participating in the creation of these ideas, or was it mostly, by chance, white males in history yeah, who, it, were, it, it, who it, were making a lot of these decisions? There, there were not many women participating. It, it is rumored that Isocrates may have allowed women some access to his school, but uh, for the most part, no, there was a, a, uh, a rule against that. Why and, do you think that was? Do you think they, because they were up to something that they couldn't have the respect of women if they knew what types of tricks these guys were, were well, using? Well, I think, I think these, these uh, homosocial groups, such as Freemasonry and e the guild societies of yesteryears, uh, would, would benefit. And I think there's a mutual benefit among some men to try to keep women down in order to have rule and dominance over them in society. Or and even you, an absence of conscience or, you know, to help uh, instill some sort of group think. Sure. It, it, to, to, to proliferate social roles. All right. All right. So the origins of, so, uh, of sophism, the Enclicleos Paideia, uh, these sort of ideas that come out of this great chain of being, which is, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, a caste system, very, very similar to the English caste system or class system today. Sure. And it really is that same thread. And, and I, I hope I intend to show how this, this tradition travels through history and allows each empire to be immortal. And that was uh, in Arnold Toynbee's own words. The great chain of being, as applied to education, I'm going to read a, a quote from American Philosophy, an encyclopedia by John Lacks. He says, you will find, when applied to education, that you, the great chain of being is the presumption that subject matter should be organized with respect to each other in a manner that mirrors the gradations of the world. The medieval organization of learning in a trivium and quadrivium of sciences was explicitly hierar hierarchical. So this, this concept of the great chain of being relates directly to the concept of organic unity. And this concept of organic unity as applied to the great chain of being is the degree to which one's worldview maintains an equilibrium with the foundational ideas. So You'll it's uh, like a homogenization, or I, I see that evident in the uh, United Nations Charter of Human Rights. It, it says uh, all these great things, and then the last thing it says, oh, if you disagree with the United Nations, you know, that's not allowed. So you have these rights as a provisional is that uh, positive rights? Is right. That what that's yeah, called? you're dealing with the difference between positive and negative rights. How would if, you define those? Well, if you're familiar with with Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson was a proponent of negative rights, where the government would be there as the servant to the people, mm. and if that government ever got out of hand, the people had the right to overthrow that government, and they were to keep the government in check by staying knowledgeable about the first principles of the government itself. And he also put forth what were the, the, uh, the ideas and as a proponent of nullification powers. And there's a great documentary called Nullification, a Rightful Remedy, if anybody's interested in the Tenth Amendment movement and what, how, what that means to uh, the foundations of the Constitution. And, and Do you think that maybe Thomas Jefferson should have written a preamble to the Constitution to memorialize the... The, the first principles or the, the axioms of which we all share existence so that the rights listed in the Bill of Rights would actually have some logical derivation and proof to be justified and not be accepted as a gift from government, you know, centuries later? Sure. Do you think that would have helped? Well, I think what happened was, and, and in some ways it benefits society, in some ways it, it is, a, it, it is a deleterious uh, in the sense that uh, it, it is sometimes uh, am, uh, ambiguous, where people can argue on either side. And that's really where, you know, it goes back to the foundations of the, the creation of the first two parties. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, speculation or a lot of talk about how uh, that would play out. And I think a lot of that has been accurate as well. So um, it, it's not that, um, that, that rights... It's not that rights don't exist inherently. It's that when you have rights that existing inherently not being understood logically, they can't be defended, and thus the government comes along and says, hey, you don't have inherent rights. You have rights because you live inside this border, and we're the government, and we're an authority, and we have the power to grant you rights. And it's not the other way around. And when people forget the first, they become susceptible to the second, right? 
And so that pattern will trace through history from the earliest times in Greece up through the American Revolution and into the 20th and 21st century uh, in a very interesting trek through time. So where would you like to take us next? Next, I'd like to talk about the concept of organic unity and how this applies to the great chain of being. All right, so let's start with the definition. The concept of organic unity as applied to the great chain of being is the degree to which one's worldview maintains equilibrium with its foundational ideas. You find this idea conveyed as a form that consists of interdependent attributes, like the body being composed of organs that operate in conjunction to one another or applied to a set of experiences, beliefs, or attitudes that are subjected or owe allegiance to a unifying concept or consciousness subjected or owe allegiance to a unifying concept or consciousness. It's going to be very important going forward. In literature, organic unity is what establishes the continuity of a particular theme. And I have a quote from Scott Buchanan, which I think bears this out quite well, if I can read. So it is with the ordinal and cardinal, cardinal elements of a story that the storyteller operates on a set of elements. The incidents then arrange themselves, usually in some temporal order. Then characters begin to take shape. Still, the author who sees himself as a craftsman only claims he has presented only a story. If he's more sophisticated and critical, he will recognize his characters and watch them remake the story. Finally, they will take the work completely out of his hands and create their own situations. His characters at this point have become cardinal, and their actions dictate the ordinal structure of the story. So moving forward, I need to go over some definitions in order to bear out the research here. The concept of authority in the etymology, I would reference the auctors, which were the storytellers. So our concept of authority comes from the auctors, or the telling of a story. Next concept that would be important to know going forward is the polis, which is the Greek city-state, or the state in its idealized form. Now the polity is a civil organization or a civil order, an administration of state, or an organized society, or any community of men, volitional or otherwise. So this would be where we get the state, or it's used in statecraft. The next would be episcopal, which is relating to a bishop or constituting a government of bishops. This is found in the Protestant Episcopal Church. So putting those two concepts together, you get a form of government or a hierarchical structure of authorities that control local churches under one bishop. And that's called Episcopal polity. And you find this within Catholicism, you find it within Anglican theology. And Anglicanism is adherence to a doctrine or discipline from the Reformed Church of England. So we can use polity to manage the politics. Correct. Politics to manage the polity. Right. And this, is this concept of the polis is actually the derivative term for the police or the metropolis, metropolis. So it's interesting to see how these concepts have survived over time, how they continue to be used as models in civil order and civil society. Before we get too deep into what you found, what were the differences you distinguished between the classical trivium of the, the research you're about to talk about and the trivium method of critical thinking and creative problem solving as presented by Gino Denning in the Gnostic Media Podcast? One of the things I've found intriguing between the differences of the trivium method versus the trivium historically as a classical education or as a curriculum uh, is the fact that it was kind of presented in a way that was uh, related to a mythology around the seven liberal arts. So I started to look into what the seven liberal arts were and where they came from. And when you do that research, you come across Plato and Aristotle. And that is being said by many historians from Thomas Davidson to Elwood P. Cubberley at times. But when you really start to dig into where educational philosophy comes from, it comes from Isocrates. And Isocrates was one of the Attic orators who was first to put together a systematized uh, education system called the Enchicleos Paideia. And this is an inner circle education, or all that keeps the common track. Today we would know it as a general education. And what I propose is that it's not much different from the uh, Prussian education. There is no divide between Prussian education and the trivium, because Philip Melanchthon, later in the German times, adopted the trivium method from the uh, Renaissance humanists and incorporated it into the education system that later uh, was proliferated by Frederick the Great and then Johann Fichte. All right, so these are characters that you're mentioning, Frederick the Great, Johann Fichte, or Fichte, Fichte sure. uh, who have been made famous by John Taylor Gatto through his books, The mm -hmm. Underground History of American Education, and The Ultimate History Lesson, of course. So uh, I know that Prussian system to be a system of manipulation and control of the human resource, of the citizens to use nationality, and um, 
So those are the more evolved virile concepts or evolutions of those ideas. Right. And so going back to what we were discussing uh, as the as title, uh, the organic unity and the polity, these concepts famously come out of Greece as far as Western civilization is you know, con concerned. Mm -hmm. But uh, we also notice the patterns in these, uh, these, uh, these Greek ideas as being something that's taken from India and the caste system and this whole sort of way of diversifying or dividing up the human livestock such that a few people can plunder those who produce in the, in the wide breadth of the public. Mm -hmm. So what, what did you find that was specifically unique to the classical trivium and its use in creating culture and making individuals into citizens of a state as opposed to what you had learned from Gino Denning through the trivium interviews with Jan Irvin? In the trivium method, it's more presented as a, a way to uh, me methodically interact with the world, which is something much different than I found in the historical use of the trivium, which tends to be tied into Latin education and kept within the divine right of kings. And it carries the organic unity of the divine right of kings, meaning the systems that gave birth to it being feudalism, coming from Pepin the Short and Charlemagne's uh, Sh Charles Martel, and those who were responsible for kind of proliferating what became the feudalist concept and how that uh, legitimized the great chain of being or this idea that there is a divinely ordered presence for kings to rule over others. And in doing so, they would use whatever methods they could, whether it be on the battlefield or, or through education, Linguistics, in order to keep things from right? the public and to subjugate people uh, based on their lack of knowledge of the things around them, being the existence and the uh, and keeping them from ever questioning uh, their rule, you know, because they're kind of legitimizing and being the storyteller, the authority of the day. Okay, so what you're describing in the classical sense of the trivium was something very much to control the perception of the individuals and to make them, you know, subservient to groupthink and mm -hmm. authority and these other concepts they really hadn't thought through. And now uh, contrast that to the 21st century version of the Trivium critical thinking method and creative problem solving method as presented by O'Denning, mm -hmm. because I thought that was a, a refreshingly uh, new look at an old process, how it's been used on history, turning it on itself. And instead of using it to break an individual and create citizens, any citizen could possess it and become an individual again by learning how to learn anything. And that really liberates you from that, that Inciclios Paidea. Sure. Well, what I found is really that throughout history, the trivium was based on a prescribed grammar or a prescribed ethic and a prescribed logic and a prescribed rhetoric. Who would You're prescribe dealing... it? Oh, it, it would be done by the authorities. It would be oh, done by the right. educators or the sophists because this is, this is the method that is handed down through Plato and Aristotle. But the problem is, is that they still belong to the polis. They, instead, Socrates through Plato discusses, you know, looking inward and trying to better yourself within the surrounding. And it doesn't overcome the collective organ that's being created. So there, there's a dichotomy between Isocrates who introduces the Enchicleos Paidea by systematizing arts that already existed amongst the polity. People would come from all over, from Chaldea, from Egypt, and they would bring these different arts into the town square, and it, people would go to them specifically to learn those arts. Why well, Socrates saw that as an advantage, and because he could make money by charging people in his school, he created a system, and they called it a total education, or the Enchicleos Paidea, which is the uh, modern word uh, encyclopedia, is directly derived from. So we're talking about a unified system of knowledge. And I think we're really talking about the beginnings of cybernetics because you're talking about the ship of state and trying to create a system and a common ground for people to exist upon. Now, it's not to say that this is conspiratorial. This is history. This is what took place. And this common ground is needed in order for us to convey ideas to each other. But the problem is there, there is, there is uh, some evidence that, that uh, Isocrates may have included virtue, whereas Plato really strips the ethics from the situation. So w we can trace a lot of these foundational ideas because we find them being used over and over in history. And, and they're being used in order to create 
state systems. So for instance, uh, in, in the 1500s, Elizabeth I is approached by an individual by the name of Richard Hacklett. And Richard Hacklett... He's got a funny spelling to his name. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he does have a funny to, a spelling to his name. And now he, he translates Aristotle's politics for her. And then she uses this as a way to create a common body politic to, uh, to send families on colonial missions. And then you see how this this affects history, and it's being done, you know, it, because it's presented as an interdependence or in a a a, uh, a a natural unity. But it's being done from a perspective of people that are ruling over others, and this is is something that is uh, very parallel. So when when I looked at, uh, I I got a hold of uh, Scott Buchanan, who was a professor, graduated from Harvard, was at Columbia University, and ran the People's Institute in New York City. How I got, did you get a hold of him? I, I contacted Harvard University and I was able to inquire into his records on the trivium and the work that he has done. Is he wrote, still alive? He you no, know, he's not alive oh. any longer. They 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 just keep his records there. But uh it, you know, it, he he's somebody that uh I found very fascinating because in in looking for the scarcity of the trivium that 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 uh, Dorothy Sayers says the lost tools of sure. learning, you know, I found it's 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 otherwise. There's a little you know? bit of myth involved with there's, how there's Dorothy a, spins it, isn't there? Yeah, it, it, there really is, and she's presenting it from a perspective that I think most people may not be familiar with. She wrote a lot of detective novels. I, I confess I've not read. Has she ever her, presented at the Royal Institute? Yeah, she actually presented uh, on uh, in August of 1940 at the Royal Institute of International affairs with Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a socialist theologian who was involved in the ecumenical movement. And she was also a member of this group called the Moot that started in 1937 under J.H. Oldham, who was an associate of the Milner Rhodes Roundtable group. And so what they're trying to do kind of is to uh, secularize uh, Christian philosophy into societal values and to impart that in a way that draws back the particularity of certain religious denominations because they see this as a break in the organic unity of Christianity where, where they say in, 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 this Christian, in this Christian ethic that... Uh, that a republic cannot secede from the the mother and the father, and it's always presented in this way of a, a familial relationship. So, uh, you you would be very surprised to find the writings that I have found that Dorothy Sayers has uh, that are very imperial, where she discusses, uh, you know, that the British Empire never sought to conquer anybody. They were just like, you know, going around to put the parrot on the shoulder and to, you know, and to bring back certain treasures. Might have been Cleopatra's needle. Might have been something else. You know, so it's it's the way it's presented, uh, and and we can we'll get more into uh, how this relates to the Cecil Rhodes Milner Roundtable group, because the concept of organic unity that has already been discussed, uh, what was the the founding drive of Lionel Curtis, who was What's the, the president. The founding drive, of, from what I understand from reading your hundred page outline, is the founding drive of Western society, and so it begins with with Sophism trying to create a collective organ which creates that organic unity through the process of education. You've got Isocrates setting up one of the first schools to really propagandize people, not for the purpose of their betterment, for surviving, for meeting their needs, for being happy, but for you know being part of the state and supporting the, the goals of the few and undermining the many. So that brings up this idea of cybernetics, which you mentioned, that's book six uh, in the Republic by Plato. Right. It's the, the helmsman, how to steer the ship of state, how to govern many people, right? And then that ties into Aristotle's politics. I don't know why they would want to translate that. That's not one of the more useful books that I've found on his part. Aristotle wrote a lot of things. A lot of them don't make sense. A lot of them are maybe racist and uh, irrational, but he has some very useful works. Unfortunately, they're not the works that are really advertised to us through history by how uh, the process that, that Gino Denning has shared with us, he's opened this door to this this uh, implicit method that we kind of all have, but he's given a name to the steps so that you can think about it systematically. And that's kind of opened the door to learning about not only Aristotle's shortcomings and Plato's shortcomings. I mean, you're able to see past the, the thin veneer that they've given us through education and start to dig deeper and actually formulate your own ideas on all of these topics. And I think that's a spark that, uh, well, that's what has created this whole this whole notion of the presentation and your in your research is that correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I first heard of the concept of the trivium through the podcast uh, with Gino Denning on uh, Jan Urban's Gnostic Media podcast, 
And that's what kind of uh, got me looking into Dorothy Sayers and the Lost Tools of Learning, trying to find historically where this uh, scarcity existed about the trivium. And what I found really was otherwise. And when you look into where that comes from, I, I don't think Gene's presentation is a whole lot different from Dorothy Sayers' presentation of how, you know, the human being learns. And she want, really wanted to resurrect this older system that's tied to the great chain of being because this is a hierarchical uh, scarcity. Like the reason the seven arts uh, itself is a scarcity. Throughout time, you find Varro and others that have added there have been 10 arts or there have been 11. And, and you find certain arts being subjugated. See, but I'm not sure in that essay lost tools of learning that she's saying that the seven liberal arts are the lost tools because she has a paragraph that talks about learning how to learn anything for oneself and how to learn something efficiently and not through trial and error because you're using a repetition of an implicit method made explicit through defining it mm -hmm. and that then then you're able to communicate and, and, and actually allow other people to turn themselves on with education and learning Especially, instead of being yeah. through a centralized pedagogical structure where one person addresses many people, much like in a religious structure. Uh, instead, it's fostering a bunch of people thinking in their own directions, uh, following their own agendas, if you will, but all using the common basis of, of logic and that which exists and identity and definition and these things that we find very useful and if undefined, we find very confusing. So uh, this idea of literacy as a form of slavery until critical thinking is exercised by the reader why did people like such as the sophists like isocrates want to create education systems that taught people how to read how to be literate slaves and not know how to think their way out of that or how to learn anything from themselves how do the how does the ruling class benefit by dumbing down the populations through creating methods like the classical trivium which are very much to inscribe a circle and, and prevent you from getting outside that boundary as juxtaposed to something that could liberate you and go in any direction. Well, since the goal really was to protect, you know, a, a falling Greece, uh, what they wanted to do was to create, what he wanted to do was to create this closed system of learning that would help to ba maintain the city-states. And it would also provide an intellectual aristocracy that would take control uh, of the polity as days went on. You know, it was very much a propydeutic function that, that John Taylor Gatto talks about. Now, he also, in educating the subjects or those that he thought uh, were capable, because he didn't believe everybody had the natural capacity to learn within his system, uh, he was also educating the kings. He wrote to Nicholas uh, that, he, that, that he, the king, needed to adopt this education system except to be more learned than the people that he was teaching within the other circle. So this is, this is where you see this dichotomy of, uh, you know, uh, control through education uh, at a very early level. Creating a knowledge gap to gain sure. power. And, and one thing that I, going back to Dorothy Sayers, uh, you know, in her Lost Tools of Learning, she's kind of ascribing uh, learning stages that she made up on her own. Sure, the poll parent go, stages. Right, yeah, I didn't right. like that part of the essay. Right. I guess I, what I focus on is what I found to be significant and substantial and applicable to everybody. And I kind of leave her personal rhetoric or her yeah. judgments, you know. Out yeah, of it. but I, I think w once once I, I'm able to present this in my in my book, uh, and you look at the evidence that uh, she is propagating through her desire to create a Christian social order, sure, where she she, she, she and, and and this is really where this lost tools of learning uh, uh, education that she's pushing comes from, because it's very much the basis of uh, Christian homeschooling in the United right. States today. Not you know, and and, and there you, sh I just think that people that are are in the homeschool movement that that believe in American or national sovereignty or or any kind of limited uh, government where you can educate your own children might also like to know that the person that is doing that uh, that is that is pushing that lost tools of learning uh, it has been said by the councils on Freemasonry if if her education system were enacted that it would be the closest to the perfection of Plato's Republic. So I, I would, I would I urge to people to ask you this very provocative question. Sure. What is the difference between the, the classical trivium insofar as it's used for indoctrination and to control your thinking and the, the other one, uh, the trivium method of critical thinking, creative problem solving that O'Denning has circulated insofar as it helps one to learn anything? Uh, because what I see is the Christian homeschooling movement is working from your grammar, your observations are predefined by authorities. Therefore, there is this logic which you can study 
and be all encompassing and just don't ever go back and actually ask the questions about well who actually wrote this book down uh, does the god of the universe actually write books or do men write books is it an art an artifice an artificial thing that comes from the arm of man and how do we tell that which exists from that which you know doesn't exist reality from unreality because i think sayers in the midst of trying to present you with this you know lost tools of learning method that can do anything there's also this seed that creates the Christian homeschooling movement. And homeschooling's great. Uh, sure, but I think yeah. that the trivium should be applied liberally and generously to all topics and all ideologies and all beliefs and predispositions and things you thought you knew. Because I think some of the most profound things that we've all learned w came from questioning things that we already believed we knew in the first place. And it's like, well, we've got this new method. Let's, let's try this out. Wow, we just discovered all this stuff that we didn't know that we should have known before we adopted that belief or thought that was knowledge. And that's how we clear a lot of the arbitrary, unsubstantial space from our minds through using this process. So I think Sayers, that essay is an interesting case study because there's seeds of the, the problem, there's seeds of the solution, and you can break it down, but you can't really do that until you're conscious of this implicit method. You're not really conscious of it until you define it. And so I think, yeah, I, I, that's, I think that's a great point. I, I just want to point out, I'm, I'm really approaching it from a kind of a history of ideas. So m my approach to it, while incorporating the the uh, recent, you know, meme that's kind of spread about the trivium, I'm more focused on the historical trivium and how that relates to the control systems and the very civil order that we live within. And our basic concepts of truth, justice, and equality are enshrined within that because freedom kind of exists in something that they they create with limits, and we we agree amongst ourselves through the use of rhetoric to. So you're presenting to, like a, a sure, union of we, opposites. Sure, and the sometimes classical you, trivium as the problem of mind control and the the trivium method of critical thinking and creative problem solving that could be the solution if individuals voluntarily of their own volition choose to start thinking yeah. and communicating sure. with each other on a more cogent level yeah and I, I think i think if that helps people uh develop critical thinking skills and they're able to uh see the world in a way that they never did before i think that's great but i i also hold out that we all have innate reason that that is not held within a structure of order and I, I think that that is something that is really at the basis of the American Revolution. And I think that it, the, the sooner we get to the historical uh, reference and uncover why this concept is so prevalent in Freemasonry and, and then learn how Freemasonry, especially British Freemasonry, since the early 1800s has been a representation of empire. I mean, there's a recent book. There's no, there's no reason to be conspiratorial about Freemasonry anymore. You can read uh, Jessica Harlan Jacobs' book, uh, Builders of Empire, and, and she lays it out, how, how Freemasonry itself is a, uh, a, a feedback mechanism almost to the concept of British Empire and Commonwealth. So when they would go to South Africa, a la Cecil Rhodes, in the Goldfields Lodge of Freemasonry in South Africa, they would use this as a way to integrate the best of the men and bring them down to a level where a certain polity can be created. And when you look at how the seven liberal arts are venerated by Freemasonry, you asked that question earlier, and I'm glad you did, because I would urge everybody to read Origins of Freemasonry by Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine wrote Origins of Freemasonry, and he did not allow it to be published until after he died. And it was published by Madame Bonneville, who is the wife of Nicholas, Nicholas, Bonneville. Nicholas Bonneville, who was running the, Cirque Soco uh, the social circle excuse me, in France, which uh, had the publisher of J.C. Bode, who was the number two in the Bavarian Illuminati. And I think a lot of what I'm going to discuss in my book is really going to demystify what what's out there about this this secretive group. Well, that'd be fantastic because the whole landscape on that topic is very foggy. I mean, you've got a couple bright spots on the landscape like uh, Philo's Reply. Uh, Excellent book. By, uh, yeah. Jiva Singh Anand, I believe is his mm -hmm. name. You've got the World Manifesto, the Manifesto of World Revolution of 1798. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, is that Marco Di Lucchetti. Yep. So these are translations of Illuminati documents and real documents and evidences and you know, evidence and artifacts of history that are now for the first time being translated into English and being circulated sure. so we can understand this. So you've been speaking about empire, the building of empire, Freemasons. Let's go back to. Uh, just after the Divine Right of Kings, a uh, character I like to talk about as Chucky e. G, his band of merry men called the Charlemagneacs, 
let's talk about Alcorn of York, King sure. Elfwad, and, and figure out where Europe started to be colonized with this organic unity, this artificial inscription of a, a, of a circle. No matter what your amorphous shape, they're just gonna cookie cutter you, everything's gonna be the same, and that's how they've built Western civilization from the start. Well, in, in trying to figure out where this word trivium came from, I, I found the source at Alcuin of York. Alcuin of York was a uh, deacon at the York uh, Chapel that would later become the archbishopric, where the archbishops of York would reside. Is this York in Britain or England? Yes, that's, that's, that's correct, in England. And what, what's fascinating is that in 781, he was sent by King, uh, I, believe, I believe it was King Elfwad, uh, to go visit uh, the Pope to petition uh, the Pope for the, the securing the charter for the archbishopric at York. And along the way, he met Charlemagne. And Charlemagne took him to the palace at Aachen, where he became the pedagogue of all of Charlemagne's children, as well as the uh, local uh, children that they were prepping to be in the uh, Benedictine orders and, you know, and so on. So it, it is in Alcuin's circle that the concept or the, the phrase, uh, the trivium, comes about. And so you actually traced it back to its origin of the word. Right. That's beautiful. The, as grammar, logic, and rhetoric as the trivium or the subordination of the word to the world and where they're putting the, the uh, lower arts before the, uh, the higher mathematical arts a as a way to uh, impart uh, Christian ethics uh, before looking into those materials. So this is where you get, you know, uh, you know, these problems with Galileo. When you find knowledge that exists outside of that circle, it causes a major problem for, for those that are perpetuating a certain belief, you know, whether it's flat earth theory. So this is where I was talking about the, the artificial scarcity, uh, notion to this, because when you, when you look at, you know, uh, the Enchiclios Paidea, you're, you're talking about a, uh, a city-state that was in constant threat by piranha states along the Mediterranean. And in order to preserve this very limited system of freedom that they had worked out through this, uh, you know, conjecture that they used as rhetoric, uh, they, they wanted to pass this on. And it did get passed on, and it gets passed on through the oratorical tradition. And I think you'll find uh, James Muir, uh, M-U-I-R, uh, has has also found that the legacy of our traditional education system, even to today, it goes to Isocrates for 21 generations. This Enchiclios Paidea to create a common ground in which the concept of freedom can reside. And, you know, when you look at the American Revolution, what, what I found is that Thomas Jefferson rejected the classical trivium and, and rejected the Godhead that was above the trivium, of course, as theology. He goes on to create the University of Virginia in which he said he wanted no matriculation, no graduation, and you're to come and go as you please as you felt educated. And that didn't last much past his lifetime uh, as that becomes a hub of where the liberal arts uh, committee and the liberal arts incorporated that Scott Buchanan and Stringfellow Barr who were both Rhodes Scholars, uh, would later start from, and that would go to the University of Chicago and to St. John's University. St. John's University is a university venerating one of the most powerful symbols in Freemasonry, and Freemasonry played a role in the creation of St. John's University in, in, uh, in Maryland, uh, in Annapolis, and that is where uh, Scott Buchanan, as well as six other Rhodes Scholars on staff, uh, were uh, trying to reincorporate this Enchiclios Paidea within a very selective canon of Anglo-British uh, and Anglo-European. Europe uh, European. I mean, Before we get uh, into the king and queen trying to take over the no, world, me. Let, let's, let's just take a step back to, the. you mentioned the Catholic Church and the Jesuits were what, I, what came to mind as far as education and the use of this structure coming together to uh, control or harness the barbarian population, if you will. Um, before we get into the, the Freemasons and the other, the, you know, I, I just feel the need to, to kind of fill in that blank sure. between divine right of kings and papal rule of authority to create these structures and specific groups that took these structures and went one step further than when, you know, I Socrates ever thought he could get to. Sure. Well, with, uh, with the Jesuits, the education system that was perpetuated shortly after Ignatius Loyola died. Uh, was called the Ratio Studiorum, and it, that was in the late 1500s. 
and the ratio studiorum was directly rejected during the American Revolution. And there are quotes from Thomas Jefferson as well as John Adams on their thoughts on the Jesuits. Uh, but I, I would look at the uh, ratio studiorum as a, a continuation of the humanistic education, the Renaissance humanism, where in, in some aspects it had previously dropped logic from the equation, but they had readopted this under the godhead of theology. So this is another instance I've found where the trivium is not scarce throughout history. Uh, just like it was not scarce at Harvard University and William of William Mary, uh, College of William and Mary in Virginia. This is where Thomas Jefferson himself, after the American Revolution, went to the College of William and Mary and had the trivium and quadrivium displaced from the curriculum. All right. So uh, one of the founding fathers of America, uh, in the midst of, of building what is America, discovers that there is uh, a fox in the hen house. And he says, we got to get that fox out of here. How did he discover uh, that the trivium was being used in such a way to create more, basically to perpetuate British society and that America couldn't be free if it continued to perpetuate itself based on an education model that was set up by the people who like to bring empire? Yeah, and, and he addressed that. This, what, he was, what he was trying to uh, push to the side were the educational perennialists of his day. And you find later educational perennialist, uh, perennialism becomes famous at the University of Chicago, which we'll get to. But uh, Thomas Jefferson himself uh, allowed the perennialists to uh, have a section on his college, but he put them to the side because it was involving the theological godhead it being, you know, being above the trivium and the quadrivium of education. So basically, as, uh, as John Irvin would say, putting your logic before your grammar. You're accepting the theory before you've actually observed and inspected so uh, it's condemnation without investigation. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's really how it was all throughout the Middle Ages. And even this limited education system where people were given these models on how to behave based on reading, you know, Quintilian or reading Cicero or reading Homeric ep epics and trying to incorporate the learning structure, you know, a as a model to create a certain kind of citizen. And it was to create a certain kind of person. And, and it's the same way. In, it's kind of how the state reproduces itself. Sure, it, you know, it really is. because and That's why education is so powerful as, as a tool of creating culture. But really what you find is that the, the concept of the trivium itself, historically, being uh, filtered through uh, the uh, prescribed rhetoric of those that are running the state system. All right, right so the in same the case way. of, uh, you know, the, the mid-1500s, you know, you've got... Loyola's Jesuits right. doing this, and if you go back to who is Loyola, well, uh, he grew. He's Ignatius of Loyola. That's the town where he grew up. Uh, he comes out of a, the area of the Alumbrados, uh, Alum, ah, Alumbrados secret society that is occupying Spain. So there's kind of a mystical tradition. He's a military man, but he gets hurt by this cannonball, and he's all disfigured. So now uh, he's going through all this pain. He discovers what he calls the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. And that's the whole origin of the Jesuits. It's kind of a mystical, esoteric, secret society that is there to help facilitate the goals of the Vatican and its Catholic or universal uh, organic unity. So there's, there's many different groups that want to make everyone like themselves. Uh, the British Empire, there's the Vatican, there's the Roman Empire, there's the Greek Empire. All these different empires have something in common. They're willing to sacrifice the individual for the benefit of the state. They need a process to sacrifice that individual even mentally to get them to participate in the state and defend the state with their life and all these sort of ideas. So bringing it now back up almost to Jefferson, we're between the Jesuits and the creation of America. There happens to be this, this, this movement in Europe that is so often talked about and so often maligned and maybe rightfully so, but I think until we define what it is and how it came about and some of these ideas and specifically how the classical trivium plays a role in the Bavarian Illuminati. Uh, then we can move into the creation of America because a lot of those ideas tie back into Thomas Paine and Bonneville sure. and all these other ideas that are creating America. So there is some truth to the Illuminati. There is some fiction and myth and there are some new things that have been discovered that really make a lot of this congeal and make real sense with real artifacts. Sure. Well, the Bavarian Illuminati, uh, by the story, began on May 1st, 1776 at the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria, where Adam Weishaupt was surrounded by ex-Jesuit priests 
and disgruntled workers. And now, he, was he a Jesuit? He was, he was not a professor a, he, of canon law, but... No, he, he was, uh, I believe he was an orphan, and he was raised uh, with a Jesuit education, which led others uh, among his number two uh, Philo at a time to accuse him of having Jesuitical dispositions. Baron, um, Baron Adolf Knigge is, uh, correct. was his yes. number two? Yes, correct. And his name, his pseudonym in the Illuminati was Philo, Do you which, think which goes back to the, the creation of education systems as well. I'm sorry? Do you think that Weishaupt stroked the white cat? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, was he like the I th original I think, Dr. Evil? I think, you know, I think a lot of times uh, the terminology being thrown around with the word Illuminati being attributed to pretty much anything that happens in culture is really a, a detriment to the the historical process of trying to undo some of these ideas. Because uh, when you really look at the Bavarian Illuminati, while there are a lot of things that are, are there to disagree with, you also find that they were uh, fighting against the organic unity of the divine right of kings within their provinces. But uh, they didn't have the opportunity to do it in a free country where they could actually wage war. They were doing it under a system of oppression from reading uh, the, the letters Philo's re reply, Philo's reply is mm -hmm. the name of the, of the book yep. that's translated, and uh, you're reading the first person accounts of the number two who was in the Illuminati. Who created right under most Weissheim. of the degrees, right? Right. Yeah, and in 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 that book, he he uh, discusses how how lackadaisical. Uh, Weishaupt was uh, in the creation of the Illuminati, basically uh, building it up to everybody without really having any structure. And if you look at what he, they were trying to do, they were trying to harness education for their own purposes, just like anybody else. So they recognized. And one thing, in order to fully understand that concept of the Illuminati and what they were trying to do, uh, I, I did mention Thomas Paine's Origin of Freemasonry. And in there, you'll find a reference to Samuel Pritchard's work from 1733, in which the first line, he says that Freemasonry is based on the foundation of the liberal arts. Okay, So I don't know why people may not have seen that connection. When you look at what the Illuminati was trying to do, you have a, a system uh, that is trying to do away with the state. And the state is... If you look at Isidore of Seville's writings on the uh, the civil order as relates to the seven liberal arts and how civil polities are created by providing a limited education to create a specific body of people that understand just what's in inside that closed system. Sure. So, so when you when you look at what they were trying to do, uh, they they were trying to do away with the state, but they were also doing. Uh, quite a bit of damage to to religious belief as well. Well, there's and that's also where, Freemasonry right in there, which existed pre sure. or Illuminati organization. Sure. And yep. Freemasonry, if you excuse my expression, is more like uh, the genitalia of the state. It's it's the sexual organ of of how it's injecting statehood into all these different places around the world to bring about organic unity or globalism or colonization or right. you know whichever group is doing it at the given time. But the point is that these groups that are being used for the state to reproduce are observed by Weishaupt and Carnegie in their papers mm -hmm. and they make a plan to take over Freemasonry. Sure. Well, what, what happens is uh, speculative Freemasonry, uh, which began in 1717, uh, proliferates by, by the movement of the Jacobites who move into France and then those lodges then move into Germany and become the strict observance lodge. Uh, oh, they're the guys with the red fridge Baron, Hoon, Baron Hund, I think, is who you're looking for. Okay. Uh, who started the, the Strict Observance Lodge. And in, in this lodge of Freemasonry that existed in Bavaria, uh, Adam Weishaupt saw to his advantage to create uh, degrees above those of the traditional York Rite Freemasonry, which creates a tradition uh, that transcends nationhood, where people in all different countries are doing the same rituals, the same secret language, that is really trying to impart moralistic ethics because Reinhard Koselleck has a book called Critique and Crisis. Right, that was and my in, next in this book, uh, it, it's it's a fantastic read. But one thing to distill from it is that uh, Freemasonry existed at that time as a check on state systems. So the prince could come down and be on the level with the the uh, the the street sweeper or you know whoever could make it into that 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 lodge, and you were able to discuss things uh, behind closed doors that you might not be able to talk about in public. Because what you find with the Illuminati is they had to create reading societies to. Uh, shelter what they were trying to accomplish. And they had a, a lot of... Uh, were those also homosocial groups? Sure. It, well, yeah, a lot of them, uh, you know, they're... 
prescribe they were prescribing reading to their initiates sure. you know and and when you look at the influence that the the uh, original 12 aeropagites of the illuminati have had i mean you find uh, uh, uh along with philo and jc bode who becomes a publisher of one of the groups to foment the French Revolution, you find Johann Pestalozzi, and Johann Pestalozzi's influence on education is 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 very right, widespread. Yeah, and the you find through the history ultimate lesson. history lesson. Now, this uh, Reinhard Kostelik book, uh, Critique and Crisis, mm -hmm. that's published by MIT. I found it to be a very challenging read. It's a very advanced. Yeah, it's it's advanced material, but it is well documented, well footnoted, and it and they waited over twenty five years to publish it in English. Right, that's the other point. It was it, I thought it was published maybe in the fifties, and it was just now translated. It, yeah, in, in the eighties, early eighties is right. when they they did release it in English. So it, it it's it's interesting, you know, to to juxtapose. Uh, a lot of the things that are out there on the internet to the the factual information about the Illuminati, they they obviously had order, uh, they had uh, plans for for a world order of their own, uh, and and they modeled their existence on the Jesuit order, which was already discussed. And you find that this this philosophical creation of how to uh, control education has a major role later on in movements in the British Empire. All right, so there's evidence of the trivium, the classical liberal arts in the Jesuit world. It's in Freemasonry. Uh, the 1610 Wood Manuscript says that Freemasonry secrets, ancient secrets have always been grammar, logic, right. and rhetoric, and these sort of things. So you find these uh, different uh, homosocial working groups, secret societies, if you will, that have used these techniques to control, manipulate, and harness the minds of the population going up through time. At some point, uh, post-Renaissance, there were some people that started to think about individual liberty and that collectivism and divine right of kings and irrationality and all these things were the bane of human existence and some of them got together here in America but in the midst of that you've got Thomas Paine, his works on Freemasonry, you've got his inner relationship with Bonneville, Bonneville's relationship in the, the uh, Manifesto of World Revolution of 1798. Can you talk about uh, De Lucchetti's book, mm -hmm. Marco De Lucchetti's book, and some of the unknown history of the Bavarian Illuminati and that type of philosophical influence in uh, maybe igniting some of the sparks that made some freedom and liberty possible in America? Sure. Well, Marco De Lucchetti's book, uh, The Manifesto of World Revolution, which is a uh, first-time translation into English of Nicholas Bonneville's work, uh, this book calls for a world revolution, uh, a new world order of sorts with republics. And this was being fomented uh, prior to the French Revolution in a group called the Social Circle. And this is a de facto Freemasonic Lodge where the publisher who published the papers of this organization happened to be J.C. Bode. And J.C. Bode was the number two and number three of the Bavarian Illuminati with Adam Weishaupt. Now, how can he be number two and number three? Well, at, because Philo dropped out. Okay. Baron... Adolf von Knigge, who was the original number two, had set up all these structures. Right. At one point, uh, his conscience gets the better of him. He goes to Weishaupt, and this this is all in the documents. And he says, Baby, I don't want to be in this group. And Weishaupt's like, great, keep I don't it a need secret. you anymore. Go ahead, keep it a secret. Like, you agreed because you're a man of honor. You're not going to break your word. We've already set up all these other degrees, like kindergarten, which is one of the novice training levels of the Illuminati. Sure. Right? And th this has a big influence on Prussian education because the Bavarian Illuminati originated where? The same area where Prussian education later comes out of. Right. Uh, and, you, and you find that Johann Fichte gets his position uh, within universities and he is running in the circles of, of uh, known members of that Bavarian Illuminati. He, in the address to the German nation that John Taylor Gatto has discussed in the Ultimate History lesson, he personally references Johann Pestalozzi's uh, methods of education. You can find in Philo's reply where, where Philo Carnegie actually stays at Pestalozzi's house. And, you know, the, so they're buddies. Right. They were, they were, this is all, you know, very much in the same realm. So the creation of, uh, the uh, Prussian education system is really giving birth to an idea of romantic nationalism, where there is a strong adherence to the state and a strong positive rights kind of atmosphere. But wasn't Thomas Jefferson uh, one of those, uh, you know, strong nationalists? And, you know, what, what did he, he's in the midst, he's in between the Illuminati, Prussian education, somewhere in the midst, he's like, whoa, this, this whole thing might not be a good idea to just train people all to be the same. 
that would take a lot of self-reliance away from America and, and basically shoot the whole plan in the foot. So what did yeah. he have to say about the classical trivium of basically mind control? And he had not yet experienced the 21st century edition where you can use that to free yourself. What, what was he in the middle of? I would look to Milton Peterson's works on Thomas Jefferson. He's written over seven books on Thomas Jefferson throughout his life, biographies and more specific topics. But what I've found is that uh, Thomas Jefferson's rejection of the classical forms of the trivium was tied to his view that it was connected to the great chain of being. This idea of kings and bishops and a caste ordered system. caste society. Right. And he saw that as a problem because if you're, you're, you're teaching everybody in a specific way or you're subjugating anybody's learning, then you're creating an unequal situation. Now, that's not to say that Thomas Jefferson didn't have his own contradictions in his own life. And he did want to have a general education for the people, but it was a much more... Uh, it was a situation where they were trying to impart the first principles of government that were self-evident during the revolution uh, and figure out a way to, you know, get the system to sustain itself. So it's not like the the idea of maintaining a balanced government or creating a poly body politic went away, but the first principles were vastly different. And, and Well, when you say first principles, are you talking about things like, you know, Thomas Jefferson and the people of his day realized that the world exists they are in it, they're conscious of it, they have certain needs to survive, they have to go about meeting those needs. How they go about meeting those needs for themselves is of no matter, but within the context of other people, you can't plunder their production because you sure. wouldn't want your, you know, so this brings down the derivative proof of non-aggression and self-reliance, and that was what America was built on. And then it seems like in just a couple years after that, some other ideas, some other philosophies came in when no one was looking and changed those terms and those, those ideas 180 degrees to get the exact opposite result of what the intention of America was all about. And I think what you're on to is, is the genesis of how that all happened between the transition of the Bavarian Illuminati, Adam Smith's uh, you know, capitalism work in 1776, and the creation of America, all in the same year. And then in 1805 in Prussia, you've got the origin of the Prussian education system. It's almost as if America presented a very specific problem to the ruling elite. And a few years later, they had come up with a formula to crack into our self-reliance and to breed the liberty and freedom out of us. Sure. I, I think that's very well said. Uh, what, what I found with uh, looking into the basis of the American Revolution and looking into the uh, linguistic foundations in the Declaration of Independence is that you find that it's using John Locke's concept of a linguistic nominalism. When you look into the concept of nominalism and the uh, idea of natural rights liberalism, it really stems from the nominalist rejection of the authority of the day of the church, where theology itself was created. I would point toward people towards William of Ockham, who was one of the first to uh, acknowledge the inner subjective and objective world within this nominalistic strategy. But and he made it, that razor thing, you know. Uh, sure, Occam's So Occam's uh, razor yeah. isn't useful because Occam was a nominalist? What does a nominalist actually mean? What does that mean as far as philosophy of that which exists or, you know, that which does not exist? Well, yeah, there's, there's, there's a difference between what I'm imparting in linguistic nominalism and nominalism itself, which really starts questioning whether things exist in front of you. And uh, you find that the, during the American Revolution, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hume, Hume yeah. uh, was was rejected by was rejected Not in, in John Adams and Thomas Jefferson's own letters. They they speak very ill of of Hume in his works. When you start looking at the ideological origins of somebody like Thomas Jefferson, uh, people say he was adopting the social contract of of Jean Jacques Rousseau. Uh, so you look into John Jacques Rousseau, you look into John Locke, who really uh, created a kind of rejection of the trivium itself. There's many works you can find online and I'll have in, in my book where uh, he started to question whether or not meaning itself was imparted by the, the language which we give to it and the object itself still exists. So I you, have this I.A. Richards start, book, The Meaning of Meaning. So. Yeah, that, that it plays a, a, a major role as well. And so when, when you start thinking about uh, particularity and universality, uh, there have been movements throughout time 
where Charlemagne himself wanted to, you know, on behalf of the Holy Roman Empire, spread education in certain parts of Europe. You know, in Scott Buchanan, who uh, wrote the Doctrine of Signatures and Poetry and Mathematics, he he po- he postulates that that uh, that the grammar teaching was imparted into England, and that the rhetoric was imparted into Germany, and that that that's why the French are so strong with logic, or you know, and this is something that he he put forth, and he he gets credited as somebody that created uh, the that that rediscovered the trivium in our time. But we'll get into that. Back to Thomas Jefferson and the American Revolution. Revolution. So as I said, looking at Milton Peterson's book, you find that Thomas Jefferson rejected the classical forms of the trivium uh, as being connected to the great chain of being and this idea that proliferates through education. And they didn't want to adopt the same educational strategy that had created the colonial problem and people's adherence to false authority. And even in Thomas Paine's work, you find that, that, the, uh, that England was not to be seen as an Atlantic power. And so there was a, a huge rejection of authority within this, as well as on a theological ground. But he, like I said, he went personally to the College of William and Mary and displaced the tra- classical trivium there. He did so at his own at his own school. Now he did provide Latin learning and Greek learning, and even tried to teach Anglo-Saxon languages. But what he was really interested in was uh, comparative grammar. And the story that I've I've come across uh, that I'd like to relay is that. He, he once lamented that the Native American population had uh, been wiped out uh, and the fact that the languages were not preserved in such a way that they could figure out the, the etymology uh, of these words and where this language came from. Thomas Jefferson collected uh, many languages of the Native Americans throughout the United States. Sure, he went to study with the Montauk before they became extinct to try to capture their language and memorialize it. Right, and in doing so, he found that when one s- part of the tribe would separate, uh, they would totally create a new language in order to do away with, you know, the the common code that would, you know, give up their positions and all these different things that would be relative in trying to separate from a father nation that had done them wrong. So they would create a completely new dialect that was completely unrecognizable to their previous uh, uh, persuasion. To so, break the chain of uh, transmitting energy or power through the language, they couldn't be right. controlled if you couldn't understand their language. Right. And so I, I found that very fascinating uh, in relation to comparative grammar. He kept all of those in a treasure chest, and the story is that it got lost down a river uh, at one point. So uh, what, what they sought out to do was to create a new uh, uh, American uh, language, which is really the language of American nationalism with the first principles based on natural rights liberalism and uh, the the negative rights view of governmental structure. Now, he went Negative back, rights, again, being that rights are inherent to the human being because you're a living, breathing human being, not right. because governments right. exist to create your rights. Right. right. Rights are inherent, and he, and, and he ascribed them to an ethereal plane. So building on what Thomas Jefferson found with the Native American languages and how one one tribe would separate itself from the father tribe in order to create its own new culture. Uh, the American Revolution didn't have that uh, opportunity. You know, this was a sudden break from its 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 parent country, and so they didn't have the opportunity of creating a new language. What they there sought no, to do did they create any neologisms to try to inspire? Yeah, that was the goal was to use. Neologisms, neologisms, new to, words, right? Fancy. To create, yeah, new words in order to impart new meaning and to build out of, which you find later through the works of people like Buckminster Fuller and and how he used the concept of synergy and the creation of new words to create new realities. So if Jefferson now, had one or two generations to create these neolog these neologisms, these new words and to uh, create a new education system that was kind of free form and not recreating the British Empire in America, right? then we might have had more of a fighting chance. But as it was, they had to fight a revolution. And after that, they kind of had to organize. Well, they had to figure out how to preserve the principles that they were instilling in the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution. You find many of the people that are the so-called founding fathers finding even fault in some of the Constitution's, uh, you know, uh, proclamations as well, uh, you know, happening 10 years after the fact. So it was not only Thomas Jefferson. John Adams created an American Institute for American English, 
which he hoped to proliferate and to be the envy of the world. Because when you find, what you find is that the, the trivium and quadrivium liberal arts education system that had been imparted for many, many generations, you, you were learning in Latin and you weren't learning necessarily in Greek, which is what Ben Franklin said. Ben Franklin in his autobiography talked about how people say that if you learn Latin, you can learn all other languages. He said, well, that's, that's kind of absurd. You know, why don't you learn Greek then? Because that came before that. And then what came before that? So it, it's, it's, uh, the, it's best solidified. The, the, uh, well, I want to interject this, just about Ben yeah. Franklin. He's a very interesting character because he's enigmatic. He's got all these secret society sure. relationships, Freemasonry, sure. all these different countries, Hellfire Grandmaster, Club. Hellfire Club. Uh, he starts the American Philosophical Society. He starts the Pennsylvania Militia. He starts the University of Pennsylvania. He's uh, making eyeglasses, electricity, printing press, yeah. money, all these different things. How, what kind of education might he have had? Uh, was he going through? I mean, I, I believe at one point he attended Harvard. Was he getting the trivium classical education? And did he at some point break away from that and start doing learning on his own? Or had he always learned how to learn and learn for himself? Well, that's interesting because, it, it, you know, as a Freemason, within the entered apprentice degree, which is the second degree of Freemasonry, they, they venerate the seven liberal arts. Now, there's some question as to whether or not they actually go through a learning system where there is a prescribed grammar of text that they need to read. And I'm sure there is in relation to the language of the rituals that are done in the lodge. Uh, there's some interesting analysis that, that seems to suggest that uh, some of what is taking place is not as much esoteric as it is ritual to impart a certain moral feeling. And that kind of goes back to what Reinhard Koselleck says about Freemasonry being a, a moral check on the state. And what Freemasonry throughout history has not been uh, afraid to uh, adhere itself to would be different forms of government. You can, whether it's a monarchical system, Freemasonry has existed within monarchical systems, within democracies, and so on. So, um, I, I think there's a, a parallel between uh, Isocrates and the creation of a Inciclios Pedia, a closed system language that was meant for the, the kings on one side and the subjects on the other, uh, to this homosocial transnational organization that seeks to impart a certain uh, uh, way of looking at the world. Well, it's a, it's a craft that seeks to create citizens, not individuals, right. seeks to bolster nations and do, and do all these it, sort it, of things of empire building. Very much so from Jessica Harlan Jacobs, you know, uh, work monumental, you know, that I had never like I I've gotten into the basic grammar of Freemasonry, gotten their dictionaries or encyclopedia. I because there's multiples mm -hmm. uh, gotten into the source documents. But the way that she spins it from, hey, here's how the British Empire basically replicated itself all around the world and guaranteed that men weren't learning necessarily how to learn anything for themselves or even the esoteric nature of their own craft. But rather, we're just being formulated to be almost uh, servant, uh, to servile, obedient soldiers, politicians who would all serve into that organic unity without really being told you're here to create collectivism and take away individual rights and spoil rationality and reason sure. for the world under the cloak of humanitarian, uh, esoteric, you know, studies with the tracing boards and the liberal arts as right. their foundations. Yeah, to create a universal brotherhood, and right. and they 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 adopt the great chain of the great chain of being within their familial familial model model of the lodges. You have the mother lodges, and then you have your brothers within the organization. So this is one of the earliest and most successful in our time uh, transnational organization that becomes their a model. Pro they're Protestants seeking a universal brotherhood, which is universal means Catholic. How are they, uh, you know, juxtaposed to the Jesuits as far as a fraternal homosocial society? that is seeking power and creating images of itself through its its conditioning system and I its think, rights and degrees. I think that there's a philosophical similarity uh, in the concept of organic unity where you have an order and then you have cardinal elements within that order. And that's the same way, that's where that's where storytelling comes in with the concept of authority. So you, you have, let's say, uh, an order of cardinals and you have the order that they are uh, subscribed to, and they go out in the world to spread the gospel or whatever the Roman Catholic Church 
uh, wants to push in a in a moral representation, dogma, right, dogma, etc. So so it's it, it's not so much that this organic unity principle has to always be. Uh, controlled in a temporal manner where there's direct orders. It's that the phil philosophy has already been adopted and then that goes out into the world to create its own story, which so goes, goes back, back to, to the philosophic corruption of reality, a philosophic corruption of what people attribute truth and reality to. And instead of it being existence and using your observation skills, it's whatever this authority, this author, whether it be the Pope or the King through whatever they're claiming the rights of being special and you're not. Right. Right. So that all breaks down under heavy scrutiny, under defining your terms. You see it a lot of, you see a lot of politics and religion playing on ambiguities and they don't want you to talk about these things because talking about it, you might start to define terms. You might start to clarify things. You might start to perceive the ruse, you know? Uh, so let's, let's tie all this together. Now you've got the classical trivium, Thomas Jefferson, how do you want to take us from that, that era forward into, uh, let's say, the 1800s? Sure. Well, I, I think the best, uh, best thing to impart is, is to look at Thomas Jefferson's work and the things that he did in relation to the liberal arts education system and displacing these forms as being connected to the great chain of being. Uh, I've mentioned a couple examples of that, and it was really it, it it really needs to be understood that the English language itself wasn't didn't have a formalized grammar until the masses rose up in the early 1700s and kind of desired to have some general ordering structure in which the English language were to exist upon. And so when that come in the United States, you know, with with there's st there's still Latin learning based on this liberal arts canon, based on a selective canon. Sure, I took four years of Latin because I was told that it would give me the key to the essay and thus the key to college and thus the key to life. Sure, that can be the case in colleges such as John Taylor Gatto has talked about where certain schools are teaching the active literacies and you can bet they're doing it with Latin learning. You know, and, and to some extent when you look at what I mentioned earlier with Alcuin of York, when he created the concept of the trivium, putting these three uh, arts of, of rhetoric and of language subjugated to the natural world, this, this creates a dualistic personality within Christianity that we probably don't recognize in uh, other religions. So it, that, that's something that, that plays a role in kind of this othering of the natural world. And that, that goes uh, to speak to some of Basil Bernstein's work on the trivium. And so what I'm trying to show with, with the rejection that I have found of some of these perennialist educational concepts in the United States, not only by uh, Noah Webster, John Adams, Thomas Paine, uh, but also by later uh, Emerson and Thoreau, who encourage ne uh, neologisms and they speak against the European culture. And, and while Thomas Jefferson did, did accept some of the concept of Rousseau's social contract, if you, if you look into to Rousseau's work, uh, he, he, he describes the liberal arts as the chains which weigh down, which fling garlands of flowers over reality. And, and so, it, you know, it, it, there is a direct connection between the, the philosophy of Rousseau and the American Revolution, as well as with the Bavarian Illuminati. It's almost as if Rousseau is describing it as uh, it's window dressing. It's a epistemological cartoon of society used sure. by the state to propagate the state instead of you actually getting right. in the dirty details of how government works, how history has worked by the, the rulers and the victors right. destroying. And, and it, so it, it almost had become recognized as a techne or a technology, which is a craft, which which can be used to perpetuate a certain kind like of culture. Masonry. And the, 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 you know, during German idealism, they recognized that as well. Uh, on the American Revolution, the last quote I, I would leave here, I, uh, I have two from Thomas Paine. Uh, he says, learning does not consist as the schools make it now consist in the knowledge of languages, but in the knowledge of things to which language gives names. And that's from the writings of Thomas Paine, volume four. He also states that the American constitutions were to liberty what a grammar is to language. They define its parts of speech and practically construct them into syntax. So you start to see where this concept of the trivium really plays a role in, in statecraft throughout history. Um, Thomas Jefferson uh, also was friends with a French philosopher by the name of Destut de Tracy. And Destut de Tracy had been imprisoned, uh, in which he wrote a, a book called Elements of Ideology. 
And in this elements of ideology, with help you know, philosophically uh, in the lineage of Francis Bacon, he took grammar, logic, and rhetoric and displaced rhetoric because it had fallen out of favor and brought in ideology, which was to be the science of ideas. Now he gets this idea of the science of ideas from Condillac, who Condillac develops kind of this, uh, this statue of man in which each attribute that makes it individual and thinking itself could be applied slowly over time to see what it is that, that makes humans tick. And they're trying to solidify a literal science of ideas so that's through like ideology. To the clockwork orange mentality that comes out of Prussia later. Sure. Let's go back to this funny name that you said, De Stutt de Tracy. What, the, the first 10 times that you had said that to me in, uh, in the past six months in your research, it kind of just bounced off me like noise because I didn't take the time for myself to define it and understand it for myself. And so you see that this uh, uh, different name, it's you know, De Stutt, which comes from a, a city that his family was from, and that became another part of the name, De Tracy, another town mm -hmm. that they had moved to, and they combine these names, and it ends up being this individual's name, uh, even though it's a, a very unique name, it yeah. kind of just bounces off you until you take the time to look at his pictures, see when he lived, get to know a little bit about him, and then I found myself, like, the door's open, now I can understand what his philosophy is, what he's talking about, but until I could actually get the definition and, and the nomenclature straight in my head and have a picture and understand how it's spelled, for me, it was very hard to get, you know, an understanding. So, uh, if, if you at home sometimes have these problems, you're not alone. So let, let's bring it forward from De Stutt to Tracy and these ideas to Prussian nationalism that comes up right after, you know, uh, the American Revolution, the War of, War of 1812. There's a lot of turmoil going on. There's a lot of, uh, I guess as a result of Hegel discovering that the true nature of individuals is to be free, this told governments, hey, your clock is ticking, you are obsolete. As soon as everyone realizes individuality is where it's at, collectivism is done. So in the past couple hundred years, you've seen a, an escalation of collectivism and these ideas and these philosophies, the philosophic corruption of plunder and, and, and taking away from people who produce. The 1800s is just the hotbed that le led into the 20th century, which led us into the predicament where we actually had to stop what we were doing and enjoying life and figure out what was going on because the you know, internet makes a lot of this information available but very few people take the time and diligent effort to organize it as, as you have sure. to make it useful. So let's fill yeah. in the 1800s a little bit. Sure. Well, with, with the American Revolution uh, rejecting this ratio studiorum or this concept of a unitary education, uh, this is based on the fact that it's not compatible with a government based on natural rights liberalism, based on a natural rights philosophy. And this, this is even discovered later by the utopian societies, such as Robert Owen and those that followed Horace Greeley, in which Zoe Thurmond, in her book, uh, the, the Phalanstry Revealed, uh, discusses how they could never have a general education uh, ran by the state within a system of liberty, within a system of natural rights. And Frederick Bastiat also speaks against the unitary education system. He says, if you, if you agree that you should have a unitary press, why not then a unitary education and all that, you know, it's, it's the state top-down control. And James Madison also spoke before Congress and discussed how the unitary education or the direct control of education by Congress would be in direct uh, contradiction to the founding principles of the United States and undo the work that had been done prior to the American or, or prior to the American Revolution and, and, and onward. Why so, do you think Jefferson left out any part about education out of the Constitution? Because from our understanding at this current point, the way that this country has been undermined, the way that self-reliance has been bred out, the way that they've changed the definitions and terminology of what is freedom, what makes America into collectivism, and people can't tell the difference anymore that could have been protected in the Constitution, and I don't think an amendment at 28 or 29 or whenever they get to doing something like that is going to help, because that's at the bottom of the list. It almost needed to be set out as a preamble to say, there are certain things that will enable people to become free, to remain free, to, to right. defend themselves against predators, to organize voluntarily and not come under the madness of King George ever again. What do you think went wrong? Why do you think they, they didn't maybe you know, include that? Well, I think there was a lot of ambiguity in, enshrined in it, as I said earlier, that, that causes problems uh, over time. But it also allows for progress uh, that, that is uh, within the realm of the people to take place. 
Um, now, the arts are mentioned in the Constitution, but it's not in the context of the liberal arts. It's mentioned in the concepts of the context of arts that man creates. And at the time that Jefferson and others were, were you know, gathering to, to enshrine the Declaration of Independence and in the Constitution later, um, there was no unified science. There was no uh, symbolic unified science of a Bertrand Russell. There wasn't even or a of unified a, of, of a Ludwig inch Wittgenstein of measure, right? right? They, at that time, right? And, and exactly, and they were very interested in Linnaeus's uh, taxonomy, but they wanted to take take some of his ideas and create their own new taxonomy because in the United States, it's it, it was said at the time that that uh, it, it it speaks in a language that only nature can interpret. And, and so it's a rejection of these older uh, prescriptive ideals and uh, education systems that allowed uh, such a high literacy rate uh, in, in the early days of the American Revolution where people, you know, like Thomas Paine's uh, Common Sense uh, national bestseller. Now, it, it, it's, it, it's interesting to see how the trivium and the liberal arts education gets applied across the board in different ways. But you find that it starts with language learning. And what you're trying to do is an impart a language so people can speak within a, within a society and have uh, knowledge of their surroundings. And any time then, you impart language and or reading, the next step should be how to defend yourself against unreality sure. within the confines of those right. setups because that's where a lot of authority and law and government, other right. forms of tyranny that have prevailed, take their residence, right? Sure. And and so then you have a population that is that is growing and they're reading and then you have a, another problem and how can you control this? So you have to tell stories and you have to implant ideas and certain social cues that uh, control people, you know. And this is this is talked about in a book called Intellectuals and the Masses. Forgive me, I don't have the author uh, handy at the moment, but uh, this th this this Trivium and quadrivium, the liberal arts education system tied to the Inciclios Paedia, uh, really comes into England at a time uh, in the lineage of, of the Venetian society. And Arnold Toynbee, one of the most respected historians who had his end of history kept in the Council on Foreign Relations archive during World War II, uh, stated himself that without the Venetian Empire, Britain could not be immortal. And so we're getting into uh, a, a little bit more... Uh, well, when you're bringing up the Venetians and the British Empire, that, of course, makes me think of Dr. Webster Tarpley's, um, you know, I, it's, a, it's a very nice essay from, I think, 91 or 92 on the Venetian conspiracy. Venetian black nobility. Uh, right. And so you're, you're learning a lot about uh, the type of history that Toynbee, Toynbee's probably keeping you away from sure. in order to justify, oh, the British Empire came on its own and it didn't really have its help. You know, it yeah. wasn't, didn't, it's not the continuation of an idea that was there before. And that's what I find through history, whether it's any type of news event or any type of history. When you follow the chains of power, they erase, like two steps behind them, they erase something. So you can't see how they gained that power. And so whether you're being fed a story where certain facts are being omitted and, you know, you are naturally trying to fill in those blanks mm -hmm. or the same sort of thing about the history of, of our government or our country. Uh, we have a very short history here in this country. Uh, so people kind of have a short mindset. People in Europe, they remember the last thousand years of wars and how you know, different governments took over their country and yeah, whatnot. We're lucky so, if we know our family histories, right? Right. That's an interesting point about Webster Tarpley's work on the Venetian black nobility. Uh, he actually says that they purposely uh, seeded that area with Aristotelian cults that would conflict with each other and form a synthesis, you know, of their Cognitive own. Cognitive dissonance. Sure. Right. And so when, when you when you start looking in into uh, the the foundations of, of British Empire and you look at the balance of nature concepts and the balance of government concepts, I, I would recommend Ludwig de Hio's work. He was actually a Prussian author who wrote a book uh, called The Precarious Balance on the idea of the balance of power in organic unity and maintaining international relations. Because when you're talking about organic unity, you're really talking about internal relations. You know, they, they talk about Human the body. resource, really, sure. how to manage people, cybernetics, all and, these different terms mean the same thing. Right. It's people who want to plunder your production and how to best control them. And from right. what I understand through Gatto's work and many other people who have studied the subject, uh, in the 1800s, in Prussia, they, they had some techni, some technological mm -hmm. refinements on how to control human resources. And uh, we can even get into uh, Wundt. 
and the special, you know, clockwork orange mentality that, you know, you don't have a spirit. There's no electricity running through your body or sure. anything magical left to discover. They've discovered it all uh, at your lowest conscious form being not conscious. You can be controlled and the simple manipulation of your body can be achieved. But if the human being asks questions, especially when presented with propaganda, psychological warfare, all these different things that have come about as in the 20th century as a result of Wundt and the Prussian psychological work that was done, uh, I think that everybody has the opportunity to liberate themselves with these little squigglies, you know, question marks, sure. uh, these, these uh, punctuation that we use in our language to communicate with each other. I think there are too many declarative sentences that came into our culture through Prussia and not enough questions that was the old American, you know, kind of uh, Missouri, show me. I got some questions. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't believe anything until it's proven. Show me. Downing Thomas, however you want to see it. Those are hallmarks of someone who is hard to convince because they, they know that the world is full of people who like to, uh, you know, not make their way through life with integrity. They like to deceive people in order to get what they want and gain power. And that's the story of history. So to neglect that is to pretend like we just all got here today and that this place is a big hologram. And even if that were true, what is the lesson of this curriculum being taught? Throughout history, it seems to be plunder versus production. So what did, how did Prussia refine that to make it almost an art and a science of controlling human beings? Well, starting with really with, with Frederick the Great and uh, his consolidation of the schooling there, um, you could you could actually look back further to Philip Melanchthon, who was a cohort of Martin Luther during the Protestant Reformation, and he was the one who introduced the trivium, taking it from the re Renaissance uh, humanistic values and incorporated it into German education. He's actually the one responsible for creating the gymnasium. Now, when Frederick the Great later gets a hold of this, this didn't Obama just make the, uh, some uh, some comment about the gymnasium and the German education? Yeah, system? Well, he actually during the State of the Union to continue, I guess, in the tradition of getting you know, our educational techne or educational technology from from Germany. He mentions that. In Germany right now, their high school education is the equivalent of a technical degree in the United States. So he's encouraging people to take up a very specialized technical degree uh, and, and seeing that as a way forward to boost industrial uh, production within society. And this, this kind of goes back to the idea of, uh, of Anglo-Saxon Prussianism and, and the fact that, that the United States with the Prussian education system, which John Taylor Gatto is so thoroughly exposed, um, you, you see that the United States goes under, goes under a change similar to that that brought about uh, uh, romantic nationalism in Germany. And so what it does is it creates a stronger adherence to the state. You have the, the positive rights scenario where you are kind of conscripted or you have to get licenses for certain rights. And that's not how it was done. That's not how the Declaration of Independence, that's not how the Constitution uh, to a large degree set that forward. So there's a change. Now, they instead of maintaining the, the first principles in the United States uh, the, of the founding fathers and the, the, the uh, principles that were imparted at that point in time, this Prussian education system kind of uh, distracts from that and creates a stronger nationalistic fervor where people can easily be led to go to war. Uh, they can be pretty much uh, led to do anything at the behest of national security or national interest. This hmm. is this is why we we you know you look back in history and you say how how could the Germans have did you know done what they did and allowed that in to World take War place II. in World War Two and you you fast forward that and you you almost have you do have to turn it on on, on our own culture and see why you know. We're allowing people to be we're murdered in our name society. with drones. Prussia and was a militaristic society. Sure. So you're drawing parallels between the education and conditioning system that led to Nazi Germany, which was then imported with great fervor into sure. this country and exported to many countries around the world. Japan. Uh, Japan's yeah, yeah. constitution was based on right. the Prussian constitution, right? right? So you mentioned this character, Frederick the <coughs> Great. I like to call him Fred. I don't know if he's great, but he's in charge of creating education. He was highly tied to Freemasonry, and he had Illuminati connections. So, what is the what is this this uh, cohesion of these secret society groups, these homosocial groups, and the creation specifically of public education, compulsory schooling, and the the going after the youngest among us, the weakest among yeah, us, the it, people that we should be guarding, we are turning over to what seem to be predators. Is there any evidence of that? Well, it, you could call it predators, you can call it people with a plan, and you have to really 
delineate the nuances between each group and each intention. But with Freemasonry, uh, Jessica Harlan Jacobs talks about how uh, they lodge members are encouraged to start schools themselves and to to fund group projects that lead to creations of schools with with specialized education systems. Were there any Illuminati either of the Bavarian variety or of the Colombian faction in America and New England? Uh, in the creation of schooling, and did they work with Freemasonry? Because we, we are seeing it swirl around now. You got these secret societies, the creation of compulsory schooling, Prussian militarism, the plunder. There, there seem to be sure. common themes coming to some sort of crescendo here. Well, with, with, with Frederick the Great, he, he's the one who signs the, the constitutions that create the higher degrees of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. And he signs that on May 1st, 1786. But in Kenigny's book, uh, Philo's Reply, he talks about creating the Scottish Knight degree as they were planning to infiltrate Freemasonry. So is there any direct connection between that group, which is very well documented and now being translated into English, and this other historical character, uh, Frederick the Great, and what you're talking about? Because those degrees sound very similar. Sure. I think they're, I think they're probably similar... Uh, in order to uh, draw people in. I think when you read Philo's reply, you find that they were very crafty, if you pardon my pun, in uh, appropriating the lower degrees of Freemasonry using symbology from from things that they had learned on their own. They got a hold of Masonic textbooks and tried to rework things to where they could represent like they were real Freemasonry, where they were creating these higher degrees. And they, they are responsible for uh, moving this more so than the Scottish Rite, more so their influence on the Grand Orient in France and the fomenting on the French Revolution with the lodges of the Amos Reunis, the uh, uh, Lodge of the Nine Sisters uh, there in, in France, as well as the social circle. So uh, the revolutions in Germany didn't take place until much later. Uh, so a lot of that uh, ideology got imparted into uh, into France, and according to Marco de Lucchetti, the planning for that took place in 1789 at the Congress of Wilhelmsbad, where Kanigi and others uh, have left uh, documents uh, that, 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 that tell what the intentions were of this specific meeting of Freemasonry and their attempt to bring in certain powerful people into that order. And you find that, you know, Friedrich von Abel, Mozart, uh, Johann Herder, and Friedrich von Abel, hey, uh, Friedrich von Abel was the, the mentor who called, you know, uh, Hegel his, his uh, protege. So, and then you have others like Johann Herder, who's responsible for our modern conception of nation states, who also coins the term zeitgeist or the spirit of the age sure. in which to maintain nation states. There is a thread within Freemasonry that is directly connected to the proliferation of certain educational systems that bring about uh, a, pr a prescribed value. And in France, with the Grand Orient, you have the Lodge of the Nine Sisters, which is the Lodge of the Muses. There were nine muses that were sent out uh, within the mythology that were, they were sent out on a journey, and it started to rain, and they came upon a castle, and the castle, uh, the, the king came out and said, come on into my castle. They brought him in, and the king tried to trap them there, but they were able to escape. So it, it, there, there's a, a, a continuity uh, with the, the uh, corruption and uh, uh, hoarding of educational systems in order to control the masses. Well, I think there was also a perception of this because some people started to pick up on this. Uh, there's a famous uh, October 24th, 1798 letter to George Washington, the president, ex-president at that point, from the Reverend George Washington Snyder. Sure. Interesting that there's you know guys named George Washington running around back then, writing to each other. But that's a factual letter in the Library of Congress, and in there he talks about the pernicious principles of the Illuminati and the Jacobins, and that he's all, he's aware of all this. So some people would say that the Illuminati just disappeared, they disbanded, they were ruled out. How do you rule out a secret society? How do you prevent a secret society from existing? Or you could see it as they developed spores, those spores were dispersed into Freemasonry, these other groups. In America, this, this comes to people start to smell something rotten around 1828, they create the first third party in American political history, the anti-Freemasonic party, and they start to drive Freemasons out of power. So there's a recognition that there was something becoming corrupt and they tried to do something about it. Uh, one theory is that a lot of the Freemasons went and created other types of Christianity, specifically uh, Mormonism in, in one of those cases. Mm -hmm. uh, then so you have a lot of other Freemasonic activity that goes through the 1800s, but is kind of veiled as, as other things. 
Now, uh, mid to late 1800s, you've got Cecil Rhodes and his band of merry men, uh, several of whom are also Freemasons, but they're sharing this idea of a, a British, specifically a British, not a Catholic, organic unity. And they start to, you know, leverage uh, through the teachings of John Ruskin and these other classical liberal arts, trivium-like teachers, uh, these powers to change and colonize and, and change the world in their image specifically. Can you tell us a little bit about that? With the Lodge of the Nine Sisters, Destat de Tracy was a member. And as I mentioned, he's the one who creates the word ideology that later gets corrupted by Marx. Ben Franklin was a grand master of that, right? Ben Franklin was a grand master at at another lodge. With nine? I thought it was the Lodge of the Nine Sisters. Was it the Lodge of the Nine Sisters? You don't have to check right now. We've got footnotes and editors upstairs. Somewhere at the bottom of the screen here, it'll give you the answer. Okay. Yeah. Ben, yeah, this. I guess he was a member of the Lodge of the Nine Sisters. I thought he was a master of the other one, but yeah. So uh, at the Lodge of the Nine Sisters, which is representation of the nine muses, which are the liberal arts, uh, you know, that that come down throughout history, and the lineage goes to Martianus Capella, who wrote the uh, the Marriage of Philology and Mercury, which is the marriage of of wisdom and elo- eloquence, and this is in the oratorical tradition, not the philosophical tradition coming so out of philosophical Greece. alchemy in that book, right? And so. So the Lodge of the Nine Sisters, this Freemasonic Lodge, uh, had members such as Distat de Tracy, Voltaire, uh, Benjamin Franklin, and it was part of the Grand Grand Orient of France. Now, with Distat de Tracy writing this Elements of Ideology and trying to create grammar, logic, and rhetoric, except taking out rhetoric and putting in that science of ideas, the point I wanted to make about that earlier is that Thomas Jefferson even rejected that as being too abstract because they had the first principles of government that they thought would be necessary to impart in order for the negative view of freedom to 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 reside there. So uh, I, I think that's just an important point to make in relation to his connection to Freemasonry and the ideologists, uh, and that and this was even rejected by by Napoleon because he he saw them as as those that sought to establish first principles in order to base constitutions on, and since he had you know switched power, you know that uh, that was not advantageous to him. And de de Tracy was deposed from his educational position in France, where he sought to create this. And in his own writings, he talks about making grammar, logic, and ideology, a new unity that could be proliferated on on man. Thomas Jefferson, while translating some of his other works on political economy, rejected that as being too abstract and not enough uh, principle and uh, measuring well, Jefferson of Jefferson definitely wasn't an empire builder. No, but I mean, he he obviously had his own contradictions and atrocities, and sure. it wasn't only him. And so when you point out Thomas Jefferson, uh, Noah Webster, uh, Thomas Paine, uh, and those that sought to create a new American language with a new structure and a new way of creation with neologisms, uh, this was really something that was uh, uh, was profound at the time, especially with the with the English language not being really formalized into grammatical rules until the early 1700s. So that's good for the American Revolution section. Sorry, I had to get that in there. That's all right. All right, uh, Cecil Rhodes. Well, we talked earlier about the the Jesuit order and how the Jesuit order has become a model for similar societies that seek to put out their own agendas and enact them over time. The Illuminati sure. refers Territor to the Hercules. Jesuits. Israel was based on the plan of the Jesuits. Sure. Cecil Ro- and, and Cecil Rhodes, who also played uh, played a role of taking Jesuit learnings and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's really, it's really a, uh, it's it, it's a it's a it's a concept that does go back to India in the monitorial uh, learning systems, where you have a preceptor or a tutor directly over you that's keeping direct control and can and can pit you against other people. And so that's what the Jesuit order has in its in its blood oaths. And and uh, while they have different aims, the the Illuminati sought to create rings within rings and be able to push their ideas without telling everybody involved what was going on. So it's how they make another brick in the wall. Sure. And that's the craft of masonry. What many people don't know about, about Cecil Rhodes and his plans to create a secret society is that his goal was to change the logic of the United States Constitution in order to bring the United States back into the fold of empire. He says if King George III hadn't been so incompetent, they would have been having meetings in Parliament in New York and England every other year. 
and he sought to uh, create through the concept of organic unity uh, a, a uh, overlapping set of rings of organizations within ecumenical circles, within sporting circles, within education. And this was meant to tell a story that would outlive the nationalistic concepts. When reading Carol Quigley's Tragedy and Hope, published in 1966, he's a professor at Georgetown University who was a mentor to Bill Clinton, later president of the United States, you find that a secret society of like-minded men stemming from the last wills and testament of Cecil John Rhodes was enacted in order to bring the United States back under the control of British dominion. That was their ultimate goal. Now this changed over time through the concept that I have already described with the ordinal and cardinal structures of a story. And his story was very much respected on both sides of the Atlantic. There were factions within the United States that agreed with Cecil Rhodes' vision for the world. Within his wills and testament, he sought to appoint J.R. Seeley, who wrote a book called The Life of Stein. And The Life of Stein was all about Prussian nationalism and the new form of nationalism that Johann Fichte had created with the address to the German nation and how to proliferate this onto an Anglo, uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, type of nationalism. And this is what Cecil Rhodes was after. He was constantly speaking of the English-speaking people, and everybody else was a barbarian. When they and he developed, you know, this this kind of classical model through his actions that others picked up. When he would go to South Africa and try to educate the 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 Metabel, uh amongst uh, the the population, and he saw them as lesser, and that it was only equal rights only for civilized men. Now you can see a direct contradiction. It's not equal rights for civilized men in the United States. You have equal rights because you have inherent rights based on natural right natural rights liberalism it took him a little while to work that out but that's how sure. it should have been the whole time sure and it's yeah and it, it, that's how that's how it should have been the whole time obviously there were uh, major contradictions in how that was enacted but it, I'm, I'm speaking more towards the history of ideas and the words we, we obviously know that they didn't uh, intend for women or for minorities uh, to be landholders or to have many rights that they well, could the document, but they had arguments about that because some sure. people believed you know and they didn't get their say and it was there's a right. whole lot of history that's why it's so interesting to study these things yeah. it's not just how they taught us in one paragraph in the fourth grade history book right and so with with Cecil Rhodes uh, last will and testament calling for bringing the United States back into the uh, into the fold with a copy of the United States Constitution you start to see how they sought to change the logic to decontextualize the history to and make us forget why we split exactly so uh, out of that they create the Rhodes Trust in which uh, Lord Rothschild funds as well as Alfred Beit and Abe Bailey some of the original trustees of the Rhodes organization and they bring in uh, many scholars from the United States more than anywhere else in the world they say themselves that Germany was really just ornamental they wanted to have uh, political leaders from Germany come into the fold but it was really about having two Rhodes scholars in each state of the United States and bringing the best and the brightest over there in order to affect a spatio-temporal consciousness shift uh, in these individuals that might lead to profound change away from the uh, nationalism that, that America was founded away upon. from self-reliance away from everything exactly that, that right. America was you know was was idealized to sure. be and and you find even as early as 1911 uh, the Milner group which is Alfred Milner and Lionel Curtis, those that go on to create the Royal Institute of International Affairs. And carry out yep. Rhodes's and legacy. And carry out R Rhodes's legacy, as well as add, add funds to it. Uh, and, and involved in the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, and involved in getting uh, the United States into war in the first place. They're which is where you, you, you yeah. it's, it's worth looking into to Carol Quigley's work, but, but it's not only Carol Quigley. There's Porter Sargent. Who, who has written many books on war and education yeah. and getting us into war, getting U.S. into war. Uh, and Charles Grant, uh, Charles Grant Miller, who actually worked for Yellow Journalism's uh, Hearst, Hearst. Uh, newspaper. Sure. But he, he had written several works on how uh, they, they, uh, this, this group, funded by the Carnegie Institute, for funding Rhodes's legacy as well, were trying to decontextualize American textbooks. And, and he, he laid out the whole plan of Cecil Rhodes' Last Will and Testament in 1922. And this was to remerge America back with the British Empire to make us Correct. a colony. Now, one of the interesting artifacts that I had the privilege to check out last week was that uh, handwritten letter, the speech from Linus Pauling for Union Now 
in support of bringing America back under the fold of Britain, which was Carnegie's dream. Here's and this it. starts with the triumph of democracy at sure. the turn of the century. So Clarence Strait, Clarence Street is a Rhodes Scholar. He's helping to carry out this plan. There's a book. I have the first edition of the book upstairs. I have the speech by Linus Pauling in his own handwriting. So how, how did we not get these ideas through school? Why have, why has no one really become alerted to this slow, incremental Fabian strategy of undermining our self-reliance, our cognitive fortitude, our ability to tell reality from unreality? Wait, these guys are pretty masterful magicians of, of linguistics. Well, the founder of the, Dem the Students for a Democratic Society, SDS. Uh, Har Harris Wolford, uh, was in his bathtub and he heard Union Now being broadcast on his radio. And Union Now was created by Clarence Streit. He was a Rhodes Scholar from the United States who goes over to uh, Great Britain uh, and adopts the principles that Cecil Rhodes had set forward and that Alfred Milner and others had funded uh, and, and sought to create a imperial federation, a, a union of democracies. And what, what is so fascinating and, and one this of is the, the more, origin of modern globalism. This is what Carnegie and Rockefeller and Council on Foreign Relations, all these later groups sure. are spawning today to, to end nationalism. They use nationalism to get control of people. Now they're going to end nationalism and bring about globalism. And you're right in the middle of it with right. this story. And this plan even gets proposed in Congress by congressmen in the United States. Uh, thankfully, it didn't go anywhere with the association to unite the democracies. They sought to undo what Thomas Paine had said that was common sense. And uh, he stated that, that the Great Britain would always be an Atlantic power and that there was no sense in bowing to the authority of this little island. That's, that's, that's what was being said. So this is a direct reversal of roles. What they were trying to do is undo the common sense. They were trying to say that Great Britain is actually an Atlantic power. Now, the more fascinating to viewers who are familiar with the great books of the Western world would be that Clarence Streit was a classmate and close friend of both Scott Buchanan, the Rhodes Scholar, and Stringfellow Barr. And what did they have to do with Scholar. the trivium? Well, uh, Scott Buchanan uh, was a graduate of Harvard University and in the early 1920s became uh, head of the People's Institute uh, connected to Columbia uh, University and funded by the Carnegie Corporation years earlier. But Stringfellow Barr mm -hmm. and Scott Buchanan are both Rhodes Scholars. Yes. So why does Carnegie want to fund them? Is, is, there, is there an alliance between sure. some of these transnationalists? Yeah, there is an alliance. What, what happens is Scott Buchanan becomes the director of the People's Institute. And this, this People's Institute was arranged in order to bring in immigrant populations that were coming into the settlement houses into the United States and try to educate them on a homogenized education system to indoctrinate them into so-called American values or Anglo-American values. Unity. Right. And so you had a clean slate which to work with because these people wanted to become citizens, a lot of them. So Clarence Streit creates this project called Union Now, which Alfred Milner, as well as the Anglo-American establishment in the United States, had signed on to. See, because after will, the last will and testament of Cecil John Rhodes, in which he said, you know, he wished there could have been a parliament in New York and in England, they did get something similar. They Pilgrim created Society. they created what was called the Pilgrim Society, in which one of the founders had been a brigadier general during the Boer War in South Africa that was all brought on by Cecil Rhodes and the Jameson Raid uh, that took place there. All people that were involved in Milner's kindergarten. Uh, so that was the origin of apartheid in, in South that's Africa. That's correct. Yeah, yeah Chengi Aragavan would call that the, sure. the origin of apartheid. Uh, and that goes along with uh, Jan, Jan Christian Smuts, who creates the philosophy of holism, which is really this organic unity principle that I'm trying to impart that is the philosophy of British Empire. It's the philosophy of plunder. It's the philosophy of taking away other people's rights. They're just the latest to harness it. Right. And they're trying to be immortal with it. And they're succeeding they because people... brand it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so Harris Wolford lays out, and you said a minute ago that it was so uh, perfect for this discussion, uh, he states that they would accomplish their goals of uh, imperial federation or world federalism uh, by using a, fed a Fabian society for federalists. That's the exact quote from Harris Wolford. And Harris Wolford's interesting because when, when Scott Buchanan is on his deathbed, he goes to, to uh, interview him for one last time and they write a book called The Embers of uh, World C uh, Conversation, I believe. 
uh, which is is interesting to read. And what you find out is that in the early 1920s, uh, Scott Buchanan at the People's Institute would be sitting around discussing Freemasonry with Richard McKeon and these other philosophers interested in Aristotelian societies, etc. And what what you find is that uh, he gets as, he gets ascribed as uh, rediscovering the the classical trivium. Richard McKeon says that he had just got done studying with Etienne Golson, who was a medieval scholar who spent 30 years with Marshall McLuhan. Um, who the, also wrote a book on the classical also trivium. Wrote, right, and who also wrote a book on the classical trivium and studied under a guy we're going to get to in a few minutes, I.A. Richards at Cambridge, who was trying to bring in the classical trivium through the Harvard Red Book and James uh, Conant at Harvard University, in which the general education or the trivium and quadrivium concept was being reemployed. When when I Richards came over, he said, "Technology to the rescue! I'm I'm coming to help sure, you guys and, out." And in Conant from the Ultimate History lesson with John Taylor Gatto was a chemical warfare specialist sure. who later gets into the job of shaping our youth for the yep. future. In Poetry and Mathematics by Scott Buchanan, he discusses how they used to sit around and, and talk about Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism and secret societies. And then miraculously, this is the guy who is said to have rediscovered the classical trivium. And around this same period of time, uh, there was an honors course being taught at Columbia University uh, by John Erskine, who was uh, hired and given a medal by Nicholas Marie Butler, the president of Columbia University and also the president of the Pilgrim Society. John Erskine uh, says in his memoirs that he had a, a student in his classroom who, when a uh, priest came in to discuss the logic of, of St. Thomas Aquinas, who, by the way, believed greatly in the great chain of being concept, that this student's life was changed forever and this student was Mortimer Adler. He was contesting the logic of Aquinas until it was explained to him that logic could exist within systems. Is that the same Mortimer Adler who paid someone else at Columbia to do his PhD thesis for him and then took credit? I'm not aware. I believe that's his own, that, 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 I that's his own, yeah, that his own words, and I would reference the, the Blue Trivium book, the Randall Hart Classical Trivium book that recounts that story. But. Mm -hmm. So Scott Buchanan is, is the head of the People's Institute, instituting this, uh, this new concept that he thought he had rediscovered. And, and uh, Mark Van Doren, who is the father of the uh, famous uh, trivia 21, cheat, right. who, who cheated on national television, uh, he, he writes a poem in commemoration of Scott Buchanan's rediscovery of He's this trivia concept. He's also a co-author of the great books. That's correct. And so, so John Erskine uh, is one in a, in a, in a legacy uh, bringing this great book's canonical education of selective reading uh, into the United States. It really comes from George Woodbury and John Woodruff, who was a member of the X Club, and then goes to Matthew Arnold, who said that all culture, all the best culture had already been said, and that's all that needed to be proliferated. So you see that direct connection. And Matthew Arnold, he, you know, when Cecil Rhodes was dying in South Africa, he had Matthew Arnold uh, as his eulogy. Essentially, as he, was pass as he was passing away, he had Matthew Arnold's eulogy to Oxford read to him. Uh, as he lay dying. So Scott Buchanan's teaching at the People's Institute, the source for Carol Quigley's tragedy and hope is speaking there on occasion, Alfred Zimmerman, who's also a director of UNESCO in the United States. And lo and behold, you have a guy come along by the name of William Benton, who was actually a governor of Connecticut for a time. He founded the Benton and Bowles Advertising Agency. They're responsible for creating the modern shaping soap the opera. Shaping the public image. Shaping the public image. He becomes a director at UNESCO and an advocate against nationalism. He has his house in Georgetown. Were any of these guys in the X Club with any of the Huxleys? Because you mentioned Woodruff, the X yes, Club. Woodruff, yes, Woodruff. Yes, T.H. Huxley and John work. Woodruff. They create the they create the hundred best authors or the hundred greatest at the time. And this idea, trans, you know, is is picked up in the United States by a, uh, a uh, teacher at Columbia University, John Erskine. He creates Honors 101. In that class, you have Mortimer Adler as well as some of the other characters in the creation of the great books of the Western world later. What's interesting is that John Erskine says that he never meant to teach any kind of tool for learning any subject. He was merely teaching how to read and trying to impart that. So Scott Buchanan goes to the People's Institute. Stringfellow Barr goes to head the count, the the uh, the Strait Council uh, that Clarence Strait had set up, and they later coalesce in the liberal arts uh, education uh, at St. John's University, as well as at the University of Chicago and in the, the Great Aspen Books of the Western World. I think ties in as well, and there's right. a lot of 
Plato Absolutely. logic of, uh, how do you say, the noble lie. Leo Strauss. Right. So, so William Benton. Neocons. William Benton uh, is the vice president of the University of Chicago, or Rockefeller University. Sure. The president at the time is Robert Maynard Hutchins, who hires Leo Strauss and brings him into the fold at the University of Chicago. And he's also the one that allows the metallurgical laboratory underneath the football field that contributes to the Manhattan Project. But he's, he's the quintessential uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, as he's described. So what you find since Cecil Rhodes' Last Will and Testament is various attempts through creating the uh, transatlantic organizations such as the Pilgrim Society, such as the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute of International Affairs, which was created by... Uh, fellows of the Rhodes uh, Trust and the Rhodes Will, uh, Lionel Curtis being one in particular, as well as Abe Bailey, Alfred Beatt, and Jeffrey Dawson, who was actually an American, uh, who met in the early uh, 1900s and 1919 at the Paris Peace Conference, uh, and weeks earlier at the uh, Hotel Majestic, which was meant to influence these uh, transatlantic bodies that would influence foreign policy and help create supposedly an informed decision amongst people in those countries. How did Al, uh, Arthur Balfour, the Balfour Declaration, Lord Rothschild, Cecil Rhodes, Last Will and Testament, and the creation of Israel all tie together? Well, the way I understand it, uh, the Balfour Declaration is a like a land deed that granted the land that became the modern state of Israel. Uh, Arthur, Arthur Balfour was a member of the Pilgrim Society. The Pilgrim Society was created in 1902 uh, around the American ambassador to England, uh, to the court of St. James, uh, and the British ambassador to, to New York. And what they would do is they would, they asked permission to both praise the king or the queen at the time, uh, and the American president before they started their meetings. And they would discuss foreign policy. And often you had some of the, 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 uh, heaviest hitters in, in industry and in finance of the day. And they were creating transatlantic partnerships that were usurping the uh, government of the United States to where they're trying to make that no longer necessary by creating interdependent bodies using the principle of organic union that uh, Lionel Curtis talks about. He wrote a book called Civitas Day or the Commonwealth of God. He's actually the one that convinces the, the royalty to change it from the British Empire to the British Commonwealth. Mm. And so it, it was necessary to set up a little bit of how they founded these different organizations that are meant to influence foreign policy and therefore decision in order to to show the significance of the the uh, St. John's University College later on with Scott Buchanan and Stringfellow Barr, as well as many other Rhodes Scholars. Is that kind that, of the that, modern revival in the 20th century of the classical trivium system within the confines of the American university Sure, system? and it's within an Anglo, it's within an Anglo American tradition as well as a, a European canon where they would leave out certain people. You find Mortimer Adler later said that there were no, there were no uh, African Americans included right. in the great books of the Western world because quote unquote, they didn't write any good books. So you see them trying to impart a European polity sure. uh, through this Enchiclios Paidea encyclopedia done through the Encyclopedia Britannica. Well, that's psychological at, warfare against indigenous populations, whether they be Hispanic or, or sure. African American or any place around the world. The fact that the great books of the Western world recounts here, you know, here's what you need to know to be an educated, uh, educated adult, and yet it it it's referring to neglects specific, right. specific uh, groups that might have uh, fought for their freedom and had struggle, and sure. th these types of things are not included in the historical line that we're fed through the education. Yeah, system. and it's important for me to say. I, I'm not discounting that people should read these authors that are in the canons. It's just the way that it's being presented in a, in a fashion to create a new form of polity. And that was the goal. If you look at the University of Chicago, they called it the Chicago Bill Gunzadil, which is a throwback to German culture sure. and using these tools to create a new kind of culture. And, and Henry Luce was involved with Robert Maynard Hutchins and Mortimer Adler. They created the Fat Man's Class, which included William Benton and Robert Anderson, who was a member later of uh, the Bilderberg Group, I believe he was with Arthur Daniels Midland Company. Uh, but William Benton, uh, the most significant to be influenced by this trans, this this idea that that came from Columbia University into the University of Chicago, is William Benton. He he founded that Benton Bowles ad agency. He was the head of sure. of Lord and Thomas, uh, which was founded by Albert Lasker, who's one of the founders of modern advertising. There's also but, a Rhodes uh, Rhodes Scholarship uh, mentality of the J. Sure. Walter Thompson's company. So sure, there's a lot of advertising marketing to change the cultures around the world to be 
sure. more like the British. And uh, in in uh, a book by Denise Sutton called Globalizing Ideal Beauty, she thoroughly exposes how uh, the J. Walter Thompson Company, which did the the uh, American advertising overseas for the De Beers Diamond Cartel, as well as others that Cecil which, Rhodes right. was the founder of, uh, they employed a lot of behavioristic thinking as well as, you know, John B. Watson and others. But they speci- she specifically states... Watson that, worked there as well. Yeah, he was he was a director. He was a, he worked, worked his way all the way up to VP of the company. And he stayed in... Ad so agencies, after he abused little children like Little Albert. And little Albert at Johns Hopkins University, mm. founded by one of the Yale Troika, of course, with the German uh, uh, influx of the research universities into the United States, of which Johns Hopkins is a model of. But what... what uh, what it shows with the uh, the, con- the the great uh, books of the Western world and what was being created, it was done by uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica Company, which had been bought by William Benton, who was a director of UNESCO, who himself had made many statements uh, counter to American nationalism, wanted to create a, a world government, yeah, wanted sure. to create a yeah. world government. Uh, William Benton himself had been offered a Rhodes Scholarship, and he turned it down in order to go into National City Bank, where he was alongside our Gordon Wasson. Uh, at National City Bank. He was also with uh, Paul Hoffman. They were involved in the creation of the Committee for Economic Development that developed the Marshall Plan, which is talked about in Lily Kay's book as well. The, the Marshall Plan where they were able to kind of change the European eco- economy based on what they didn't get to accomplish with the Bank of International Settlements, you know, in the 20 years before. Uh, so in the, in the 1940s, you find William Benton buys the Encyclopedia Britannica, which was the Encyclopedia Britannica. It, it was created in Britain as a counter to Diderot's encyclopedia during so the French Revolution. So it's just the replaying of the English idea. Sure, it's unified itself. consciousness. It's battling right. unified consciousnesses. That's what it is. And so you have Diderot, who has his own encyclopedia, and he has his own thoughts. I'd recommend Godfrey Lessing, who's talked about in Critique and Crisis, the book that deals with Freemasonry. Reinhard Kostel. Rein- Reinhard Kostelik's book. Uh, he, he is one of the people that is uh, said to have systematized the idea of Freemasonry as a check on states. He deals with Diderot's uh, concept of the citizen spectator and how uh, the, the dramatic effect of imparting individuality to crowds. And it's really not the performer on the stage. It's the, it's the person in the crowd that is adopting what is being imparted by the stage. You find how this, you see how these ideas. This is all about the creation of culture, the artificial creation of culture, right. not, not through natural means meeting our needs, improving our lives, living, surviving, thriving. It's not about that. It's about them imprinting their will on us. Sure. So tell me how uh, someone who hangs out with the Rhodes Roundtable group, someone who might have been a Freemason like H.G. Wells and his works, is shaping culture alongside someone named I.A. Richards, who we mentioned earlier. Okay. Can you get to that in just one okay. second? I just got to sew one thing up yeah, here. Yeah, sew it up. So William Benton, who buys the Encyclopedia Britannica, was a member of the Fat Man's course taught by Robert Maynard Hutchins and Mortimer Adler, uh, which is being ran by this liberal arts committee at the University of Chicago. And what they had done is they had similarly tried to affect a unified education by using this Socratic method and coming to a conclusion together and presenting that within that group. And these these rich guys in this so-called fat man's course, uh, you know, sought to uh, proliferate this into the business community. Uh, Henry Luce later becomes involved and is so enthralled by this as a possibility for his employees in order to give them a, a leg up on on others within the in, within the society. And this is written in uh, the Romance of uh, Commerce and Culture, which details the connections to uh, the great books of the Western world and Walter Pepke, another it leaves, member. It leaves out Luce's connections to skull and bones was the it does Russian leave out, yeah, educational yeah. secret society which takes its seed at yale right that's correct and it does leave it doesn't have anything to do with it, that that portion of it but it does talk about the importation of german culture into both advertising and uh, art at the time and into this uh this idea of nationalism using a a canon boxing to, up our culture sure and, and and really it was all about trying to bring a consensus and kind of de-individualize uh, people's innate uh, thoughts and capacities, which you find later in in the Macy conferences with Theodore Adorno's authoritarian personality, where they think they can root out jingoism and all of these other things. It's the, the desire to rescind man's humanity to a point of entropy where value judgments are no longer necessary and holding conflicting thoughts to anything but the status quo Simply like a goes to form of eugenics. Yeah, it, to it, sterilize it, your mind. Sure, and thinking. they used to call this form, you know, they used to call, there's, there's 
it's, it's no coincidence they used to call education good breeding because there is a definite connection to eugenics. So with the great books of the Western world, I suggest people pick up the first volume of the great books of the Western world or the great conversation and see who is signed on to the creation of the great books project. And who you'll find is Scott Buchanan and Stringfellow Barr, who were directly involved in the uh, Union Now project, both staffing the Foundation for World Government, the Committee to Draft a World Constitution, as well as the Association to United Democracies, Federal Union, the English-speaking Union, all of these interdependent organizations that were all meant to bring about supposed peace through a unified culture that was based on Anglo-Saxon Anglo Anglo Saxon heritage. I also and have so, Walter Forbes Murdoch, who I believe was Rupert Murdoch's uncle, sure from Australia, who was had his own university. So there's Royal Institute of International Affairs fingerprints all through that. There's Pilgrim Society, Rhodes Roundtable, all seeking organic unity of the Anglo American establishment. Yeah, the director of the the person that brings in Scott Buchanan and Stringfellow Bar uh, from the University of Virginia was a, a guy by the name of Francis Pickens Miller who was a member of the ecumen ecumenical movement. He was a director of the Council on Foreign Relations, as well as a member of the Society for the Cincinnatus, which is a uh, heredi uh, hereditary order created around the time of George Washington to commemorate the French and uh, American uh, connection during the war. Ominous continuity. Sure. And, and well, it's an ominous continuity because uh, it's seldom pointed out that uh, Mirabu, who was a, a member of the Order of Cincinnati, uh, was was a member of the, the uh, Bavarian Illuminati by extension of the social circle that we mentioned earlier with Nicholas sure. Bonneville. So it's a hereditary order that that uh, tries to keep up uh, the symbology. The, the, the design for the logo was done by Pierre Lafont, Lafont. It's very similar. He did the Washington, design for Washington, sure. D.C. And there's a lot of... Uh, there's no occult design or sure. meaning Sure. Well, it that. still exists to this day as well. And, and you can, you know, if you're a family that goes back that far, you can apply for membership in that, sure. in that order. So uh, the last thing on the great books of the Western world that I would say is that uh, Walter Pepke was a member of the fat man's class. He's the, the founder of the Aspen Institute, sure. the Aspen Strategy Group. And the Aspen Strategy Group and the Aspen Institute was founded to on the commemoration date of the uh, birth of uh, Goethe, who uh, at one point being yeah. a member of the Illuminati and then later uh, expressing some views contrary to secret societies. Right. So, but, this but nonetheless, they have this festival in Aspen, which basically is now a very popular town because of Walter Pepke's group and, and the, the, these people back then. And you, you have this, uh, again, ominous continuity of the noble lie, Leo Strauss, the neocon strategy, all tied back into the Aspen Institute, the great books of the Western world. I know, uh, for those of you who have seen our past work, you have, uh, what you've been missing in 2010, where we did touch on some of these aspects, but mm -hmm. now we've spent a couple more years figuring out what all that means and the greater details of connectivity. Yeah, and, and Leo Strauss uh, went on to be a Scott Buchanan scholar or teacher, professor at at St. John's University for a period of time as well, so there's some continuity there. I think his real legacy is yeah. the neocon party and Paul Wolfowitz sure. and Cheney and Bush and 9-11 well, and the, all the these idea different things. That, that so you can Pearl perpetuate Harbor. this noble lie, correct? Sure, right. And, and so... Uh, they create the Aspen Strategy Group, the Aspen Institute, which are obviously immensely influential, and they they also spread the great books uh, tradition. So at the University of Chicago, with the great books of the Western world, uh, under the auspices of imparting culture to the common man and ordering them to better themselves and telling them that this is a scarcity that they haven't been exposed to in 70 years. He says that in the, in the first uh, edition of The Great Conversation. Um, you, you find a legacy in international relations that I think people will find uh, helpful in understanding how this could create something advantageous to usurping national sovereignty. Uh, Robert Cohen, who is a international relations scholar, uh, attended Shimer College in Illinois, which was one of the first colleges to offer early entrance into college. And the whole curriculum that he studied was the liberal arts education system of the great books of the Western world. That's how they obtained their bachelor's degree at that level. 
Now, his partner in writing a book later in life is Joseph S. Nye Jr., who is a Rhodes Scholar and at one point a director of the, the Rhodes Trust uh, in, in Great Britain, and he's a John F. Kennedy Scholar at Harvard University. He was the tutor of Gaddafi's kid, wasn't he? Yeah, it, well, when Gaddafi's son, uh, after Gaddafi was uh, kind of turned against after the Bush administration's attempt to... And before uh, he was sodomized. Sure, yeah, before, before all of that took place. Joseph Nye had through the Monitor Group, which is now a... Uh, it's a callback yeah, to the Indian on Monitor second. Schools. Well, yeah, Joseph Nye uh, helped Muammar Gaddafi's son with his doctoral thesis, which happened to deal with transatlantic issues and how global uh, identities could be uh, established. It's worth reading, and he got in quite a bit of trouble for it after Gaddafi uh, took the turn in the media that he did, and they decided to take him out. And uh, so Joseph Nye Jr. is a Rhodes Scholar, uh, one of the most influential people in international relations. He's also a director of the Council on Foreign Relations. Him and Robert Cohane wrote Power and Interdependence, which is an inter international relations theory based on uh, 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 interdependence of nations and creating transnational bodies through corporations that would sow more interdependence throughout the world and bring about the kind of order that they desire. And it takes longer than maybe some of the British plans that were also funded by the Rockefeller Foundation with the British Committee for the Theory of International Politics with uh, Herbert Butterfield. And this is the side that really drives the Royal Institute in and more specifically, the London School of Economics. Sure, that's so, a Fabian socialist creation, also funded by the Rothschild banking family, with, famous internationalists. And they're the ones who bring in over a hundred or more of the top Libyan officials under Muammar Gaddafi to re-educate them within, uh, within government relations so they could go back and have a stronger structure of government there. And that's where Muammar Gaddafi's thesis that Joseph Nye helped him on, I'm sorry, Muammar Gaddafi's son's thesis that, that Joseph and I helped on uh, was written for the London School of Economics. So there's so much detail. And in order for somebody to do their own work and see if there's validity to what I'm saying, I would urge people to look into a paper called The Real New World Order by Anne-Marie Slaughter. And you find that throughout the Council on Foreign Relations and throughout the legacy of Rhodes in establishing these international bodies like the International Pacific Institute, etc., you find that they sought to take over realms within the State Department. And they created an office themselves around the time of the Marshall Plan called the, the uh, Policy Planning Office or the Office for Policy Planning. And if you look at the, the legacy of who has held this position, I would say that uh, over 65 or 70 percent of them have been members of the Council on Foreign Relations, if not directors. Now, who is Anne-Marie Slaughter she, writing to? Is yeah, she, she writing was, to, to conspiracy theorists? No. This was a, this was a paper of, the, of Foreign Affairs, the Council on Foreign Relations publications, the real New World Order that she wrote. Uh, by by Anne Marie Slaughter, and this is where she also talks about the complex interdependence theories of Joseph Nye and Robert Cohane, and how they are the driving intellectual basis of the Council on Foreign Relations internationally, and how they they do business uh, with their their attempt to influence foreign policy. Right. And and there's a lot of you know a lot of time it kind of gets put in a cartoonish manner. I mean these these are people with ideas that may not necessarily know the legacy they're perpetuating. Sure. Now there are there are many of them that have stated quite openly like the chairman, David Rockefeller, uh, that, that his goal is, is to create uh, an international polity and sure. to do away with and national borders. And he admits to it. Right. And, and there have been many admirals and, and people that have stepped away from the council who have said that they don't want to be involved in something that is going to usurp American sovereignty. Well, is there any um, heritage or lineage to this term New World Order? Is it something that Anne-Marie Slaughter made up? Or does it have a deeper history maybe with the Fabian Socialists someplace along the line? Yeah, I mean, I think the concept goes all the way back as far as you can, you can imagine. But with the, with, the, with the terminology, you hear that raised by, by H.G. Wells, who uh, was in, when, in Fabian circles. Well, H.G. Wells was a Fabian Socialist, a famous Fabian Socialist. He also hung out with many of the members of the roundtable groups. He admitted that there was a conspiracy and that they decided that it be an open conspiracy, that they could write about it openly, that the public didn't read. And if you had read along with Wells' books, you've got The Island of Dr. Moreau, which is about organic unity through eugenics, dehumanization through molecular biology. You've got his book, The New World Order. You've got his book, The New Machiavelli, The Shape of Things to Come. 
Uh, there's just so many connections with H.G. Wells uh, through Freemasonry to Rhodes and Kipling and, and all these other characters. He is one of the most fascinating, uh, you know, axiomatic characters that you can look into and find all these other valid perspectives of things we're told by very credible authorities in very credible, calm ways right. that these things don't exist. But in fact, they do. They're in your library. They're at these bookstores. You can get your hands and start to read into what I.A. Richards or H.G. Wells and these characters with two initials and a last name had to try to, you know, make everybody the same for yeah. management purposes. Yeah, and, and I.A. Richards is, is one of, uh, like H.G. Wells, who endorsed the idea of a American federation or a federation of democracies, mm -hmm. um, d this democratic union that they sought. Uh, to erase national borders uh, at the behest of this aristocracy or this this class that felt that they were the uh, they were they were capable and ethically responsible to control the many. Sure. So with with uh, you know with regard to H. G. Wells and the shape of things to come, he discusses uh, Newspeak as well as elsewhere where you know uh, language could be broken down in a way uh, to spread a certain culture as far as can be well, and also how it could also be used to control technology. right to as yeah to use it as a technology and to uh it, to control the thoughts of those that uh interacted with those those languages i think what hg wells is referring to is ck ogden and ia richard's work the meaning of meaning and the work that they did together on the creation of basic english which was an 850 word language structure that they thought they could introduce into china and into cultures where no english was spoken in order to have a have an inlet into commerce and into you know statecraft and to influence that that society because many of these older societies have languages that are are protected through their social customs and the way they interact with others and and there was a push as there still is today to impart the liberal arts into China in the hopes that it will create a civil polity there is a university that's doing that right now so it, it's it's interesting to hear Gatto's stories about how they want to stay away from Prussian education or see how they can try to you know work their system, but uh, it, it's also the other way around that they there was this creation of a a language structure that was meant to limit people's capacity to think within the English language. They wanted to spread it all around the world to create a unified culture. Well, language is a technology. It's a form of technology. It can be a limiting technology, as in the classical trivium, or mm -hmm. it can be an unlimiting technology, as in the case of what we've been presented uh, through uh, Gnostic Media and Gino Denning's sure. version of, of modernizing it for individuals, if, in, as opposed sure. to the, the system to make individuals into a collectivist mindset. Yeah, and and also I would I would actually take it further in saying that you know that uh, I inherent rights uh, in in our inherent capacity to reason uh, displaces the need for arcane rules of of uh, of judgment in that capacity. Now it doesn't mean that people can't use that in order to see that uh, that 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 uh, in in humankind to see to see the capacity that it already exists. And I think that's what really what what common sense and the uh, the period, you know, that people say the the fire in the minds of men was really about because it was a rejection of the idea that you had to use some prescription to uh, exist within the world because existence exists. And now, while it can help to have these methodologies in order to uh, further your understanding or to make a process streamlined, um, I, I think also there is a uh, a need to preserve the oral traditions and the familial cultures that make true culture, true organic unity possible. Well, that's what they're trying to attack. Possible. That's sure. the whole reason. Yeah, they want to do away with... They want with our rights because, you know, and they change our language to get to our rights. There's some very important things that they've taught us, you know, basically right. to forget about and that they don't mean anything. And that's the scam. That the yep. most important things aren't worth anything. The things that are worth nothing are the most important. That's the whole diamond yep. scam as, as Cecil Rhodes and all these other characters yep. have played out and, and gained power from. But it's all the use of technology, specifically language, to have a stranglehold over a population. That is cybernetics. It's using information and technology to manage human resources. And that's every bit what H.G. Wells and I.A. Richards are trying to do from their different angles. They're like a vice that's just squeezing the self-reliance out of a society. And uh, psychological warfare with H.G. Wells, the War of the Worlds broadcast, and it was rebroadcast by Orson Welles. You know? So the, this whole idea of using the mind as the, uh, or as Stephen Biko would say, the most powerful weapon in the, the hands of the oppressor is the minds of the oppressed. This is what we're describing with the history of the classical trivium, is it not? 
Yeah, I think with, with, with what I Richards was trying to do, I mean, you see him at uh, Cambridge University. He was uh, involved in the Vienna Circle with logical positivism. Ogden was Lud actually... Ludwig Wittgenstein? Sure. Ogden was actually the first to translate Wittgenstein's uh, major work into, oh, yeah. into English. And they wrote the book, The Meaning of Meaning, together, which kind of thro throws into question uh, the, the, uh, the, they were searching for the meaning of language and how language acts as a symbol for the thing that actually exists. And they were doing this in a way uh, that was very similar and very influential on cybernetic thinking. I. A. Richards himself was a member of the Macy Conferences, which is really at the birth of, of cybernetic thinking and applying cybernetics to the social order. But what I find most intriguing about I. A. Richards is his creation of a literary criticism called New Criticism. Now, New Criticism, by his own words, was meant to allow a reader to read a document of historical significance, but, but leave the historical significance out and bring that up to date to battle with the, the, the historical causes in the present tense in a way that negates the importance of keeping that intact. Decontextualize the history, break people's chain of attachment to that which originated America. And since the 1930s, because of I.A. Richards, he influenced much of our secondary and higher education in the separation of literature from history. Mm -hmm. These aren't things that, that, that used to be you know, taught separately because they weren't taken lightly back right. then either. No, because what, what, you're, what you're imparting is, is the historical study. What if you took that to the Constitution? You're going to take that to the Declaration of Independence. And that's what they tried to do. You find by Carol Quigley that the Rhodes-Milner Roundtable Group, of which I.A. Richards subscribed to the philosophy of, he wrote numerous books on the world government and using basic English in the books to describe that world government, leading up to the UN or Imperial Federation like the Royal Institute wanted. But what, what you find is that this this concept of of decontextualizing history in order to bring about an organic unity really goes back to the German Romantic movement translating into England by Samuel Coleridge. Hmm. And then Samuel Coleridge is a major influence on the liberal Anglican tradition and Matthew Arnold as well as J.R. Seeley and the people I mentioned that were very influential on Cecil John Rhodes and his 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 need to spread the English language and classical education as the best culture in order to eliminate the intrinsic value of other cultures around the world because they didn't see them to have any. They were barbarians. So I. Richards wrote numerous books on new criticism where he says the goal was to bring about organic unity from the text. This new criticism gets picked up by Cleanth Brooks and Robert Penn Warren in the Southern Agrarian Movement, mm. many of which were Rhodes Scholars. Doesn't mean they were all involved in some Robert conspiracy. Robert Penn Warren was. Yeah, he was a Rhodes Scholar, exactly. So was Cleanth Brooks, I believe. And, and it doesn't mean these, these, these guys were all directly in line, but you see the organic unity of the, the Rhodes Fellows coming into the United States and spreading these different concepts. And to prove that point, I recommend reading the latest biography on uh, Fr Frank Adiolette, um, w in which it, he, it, he is quoted as saying the goal of the Rhodes Scholars was to impart the best of English education into the United States of America. Wow. And and that that going in contradistinction to what I said earlier about the creation of new language and the new principles that, that Jefferson and Madison and Noah Webster particularly sought to create with his spellers and the, the grammars that were called spellers where they sought to the change magic and of create new words, words against people. to create right. new concepts, to, to exist and to create new concepts to further further the further liberty and further freedom. Lord Percy, who was a member of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, uh, says that Thomas Jefferson was illogical and insensible for his support of government as a, uh, a protection uh, for the people from tyranny. He said that the United States government was set up no different than any of the other colonial federations that had decided to get together to create a body that would still be part of the imperial design. So he's trying to undo the American Revolution. And there was a book by, I believe, S.S. F.S. Marvin called The American Commonwealth and another uh, that he wrote a biography of Alexander Hamilton that in 1911 they sought to read in order to discover the causes of the American Revolution in order to reverse it. 
And so you see this influx, just like the Venetian Empire brought in Arist Aristotelian cults in order to upset the culture of the time there. You see this same kind of thing being done in the United States Patterns in order history. to keep in order to keep the culture alive. And Arnold Toynbee, who was a strong member of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, as well as his own Toynbee group, which was uh, connected to the Milner group, uh, talked about in the Anglo-American establishment by Carol Quigley. Arnold Toynbee's education was the trivium and quadrivium, and it was his power of analogical reasoning that he sought to use to end the nation state. Well, this this whole idea of organic unity, the changing of terms, leads us into a place where we can conveniently bring it all full circle uh, from the Greeks all the way up to the 20th century. Eugenics, it was changed after Hitler gave it a bad name, to molecular biology. How does Dr. Lily Kay of MIT, the Rockefeller Institute, the Rockefeller Foundations, participating in the eugenics, Caltech, how does it all tie back together as the organic unity that they're trying to artificially instill and create and force on people, taking away their rights all over the planet? Did the Greeks practice eugenics? Yes, they did. And that Aristotle and Plato both maintained the use of the banusek or the barbarian or the those that weren't fit for society, you know, and they, they sought to manage, you know, birthing practices. And uh, it was all about, you know, creating a caste. That's why certain people within society, whether they're allowed be, to do anything and other right, people, that's why you have the, the warrior rule. monks and the guardians, those that would be the philosopher kings, those that would keep the those and the others in check because they said that you were born into a specific form. Right. And in, 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 in some degree, they did the same they did the same hierarchical structuring with the natural world, subjugating people based on what they thought was the quality of their soul. I mean, I've not seen that index in their logic. Well, at but least they thought in that case that people had a soul, whereas Wilhelm Wundt says, you're a clockwork orange, you have no soul, you can just be you know, played with like an animal and sure. he doesn't have to feel bad about it. Well, and, who, and Wilhelm Wundt's, you know, just for a connection, Wil Wilhelm Wundt's uh, grandfather uh, was a member of the Order of the Illuminati, the Bavarian Illuminati. And who were some of Wundt's famous students? Uh, some of Wundt's favorite students would be uh, Frank Angel, uh, as well as... Uh, of Could, Yale, uh, of uh, uh, that was Probably actually his, that's his, that's, human relations. Yeah, James. that's James. That's his cousin. Oh, that's They're his cousins, cousin. first cousins. All right. uh, G. Stanley Hall was a family famous yeah. student of Vunt who taught other <coughs> right famous people. Yeah, uh, under under Vunt you had G. Stanley Hall uh, who influenced other Vuntians in the United States like uh, uh, Edward Tichner and uh, James uh, Cattell, many as well as Frank Gatto Engel. Mentions in the many Ultimate of the people, yeah, yeah, John Taylor Gatto's uh, resources on this are uh, fantastic, and I recommend if anybody's looking for the history of the Prussian education system, there's not many better sources that you can find. Uh, the correlation of the uh, Prussian education system developed by uh, Frederick the Great and then Max Weber picking up on that educational technology to apply it in the Industrial Revolution, to imply that, I mean, in the birth of, of, uh, of scientific technology such as Fordism or Taylorism and these, the, the way that these Prussian ideals that were meant for this, this uh, hyper-nationalism get, get employed even in the industrial uh, world is just fascinating. Rockefellers, eugenics, right. population control, present sure uh two years ago when i discovered uh the molecular biology book by lily k the molecular vision of life rockefeller caltech uh and their influence on molecular biology uh i was intrigued to find somebody who had access to the records uh being able to expose the rockefeller foundation in a way that was not necessarily uh in line with what they would have liked to have seen happen uh, and she, yet it has rave reviews yet, by yet, Linus Pauling yeah. on the back. There's a quote. There's, you know. Yeah. So. And by Linus Pauling. And she even writes, you know, she, she was kind of uh, uh, intrigued by that because she, she speaks very ill of him in the book. But yet he, he saw it as an accurate depiction of what actually took place. And he was a, a signator to the Union Now project right. and wrote on it himself, as well as his wife. They attended Commonwealth Club meetings in California, in which this was the topic of the day. And, and that's other organizations that are connected to the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. 
Bilderberg uh, Group, Trilateral Group, these different sure. work well, groups. It, that even carry even out more the locally, will. they created foreign policy associations in the United States that acted as subsidiaries in Louisville and Atlanta and Florida, you know, all over, in order to push the same ideas using the Delphi technique, of course, in order to bring people under predetermined foreign policy objectives to get their support in order to manage their consent, such as Walter Lippmann, a fellow member of the Council on Foreign Relations, would have wanted. Lily Kay's book, the the main crux of her argument, uh, which I find very uh, plausible and, and very researchable and verifiable is that, that molecular biology is really a continuation of the earlier eugenics programs that were developed at Cold Springs Harbor, Cold Spring National Harbor, funded by the Carnegie Institute as well as the Rockefeller Foundation in order to try to uh, perfect this science of man project. And this, this really begins with Edward Allsworth Ross and social his control. influence of social control and the creation of the Yale Institute of Human Relations, later on the creation of the Tavistock Institute, and these different ways of mapping the human individual in order to do away with its individuality. Sure. And so with, with Lily Kay's work on, on eugenics, uh, she has shown how molecular biology really masks the eugenic principles within its, its new rhetoric. And, and it's not being done in a way that is necessarily manifest for uh, the common population. You are finding progress that is getting enshrined within nonprofit organizations. And there is a lineage for that uh, throughout time where people want to hoard technology in order to artificially uh, release things on a timed manner uh, based on how they feel the populace is enlightened or based on what would be cost effective to unleash. I mean, if they found a cure for cancer, would that undo the model of uh, current medicine today if they release that? So what you're saying is by changing the terms and definitions throughout history, this is how they've removed individuality, this is how they removed liberty and freedom from individuals, created the collectives, created the state, of any any variety through history, whatever you want to study, you can see these themes repeating again and again. This changing of terms from eugenics and their negative and positive aspects of them wanting to make themselves better and basically make uh, some other people go away. That's racism, it's irrationality. Some people might characterize it as evil, but that's a judgment. You can say on the basis of logic, it is irrational. For, the, for those few people to make decisions on behalf of so many other people that they've never acquired the voluntary permission of, right? And so what we have is, uh, again and again, by changing the words, by changing the definitions, they're changing the meanings, and by changing the meanings, they can get at your rights, and they can get at what makes you really valuable as a human being, which is your individuality, your creativity, your inventiveness, your, your studious hard work and attention and focus that comes together to formulate some knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Kevin, I would like to thank you for spending so much of your time to share with us because it, it took a lot of research time on your part to even get to the part where you could communicate with us. And I think people will be growing from this conversation for sure. a long time ago. And how, do you have any closing remarks? Sure. I think a good closing thing to impart is to just realize the obviousness of the, the logic behind the creation of the liberal arts uh, education. You're dealing with a slave versus free dichotomy where the free person was only free because they had access to this knowledge that would make them free within a system. And this, this technology perpetuates over time throughout currencies and how organic unity relates to all of these different models in our daily lives. So with the slave versus free dichotomy, uh, you, you find a direct contradiction in the, the rights aspect enshrined in the United States where rights are to be inherent, not because you have a specific form of learning, not because you've impart, been imparted with a, a general grammar of pre-prescribed authors that will create a model of the citizen they'd like to have. So the, the idea of, of having to have a certain kind of education to be free is fallacious to the form of government created in this country. And the first principles established by natural rights liberalism, which in my opinion used a linguistic nominalistic strategy without embracing nominalism, used that strategy to upset the authority of the day, to upset the auctors and the storytellers of that day and those that we place our authority and our, our values and our lives into. Now we can create common bonds through our own volition. We can create common communities that have a natural unity, 
You know, we have these sports figures today. We have sports teams where the, the, the individual playing for the team comes from a whole different region, but yet all of a sudden he's representing this city and people think this is my team and they take their accomplishes with Tribal them. Tribal mentality. Well, John Taylor Gatter pointed out Reinhold Niebuhr, one of the ecumenical people involved with Dorothy Sayers, how he talked about the, the non-thought of received ideas. And the idea of seeding your uh, own individuality and accomplishments into another person. Now, did I go to the moon? Did Americans go to the moon? We did. You did, know that. did we go to the moon? We won well, World War II. And, and, and you can look at it from a, a perspective of humanity and say, that's great that, you know, we we're as, as you were around back then. <laughs> well, no, I, I wasn't. But but what I'm what I'm what I'm pointing out is basically this idea of seeding your own individuality to the accomplishments of the greater whole and sure. especially when those entities are really there to harvest your money to get you in their seats it's not your team they don't you know it, it's good to be if if the, if it entertains you that's that's fine there's but nothing be wrong with that these other but be, be aware of these other areas and how how they can be used to push a certain viewpoint or get you to support military actions and and other things so i think it's really common sense that the liberal arts education being based on a slave versus free dichotomy and the idea that you have to uh, have some certain form of education in order to have a free mind. You know, Bob Marley says, none but ourselves can free our mind. And they very much were doing the same perpetuation of, of a strict classical education on the African people to bring in those that they thought could rule, r run the, the authority uh, down the road. So in, in the same way in the United States, there's nothing wrong with reading the great books of the world. There's nothing wrong with reading these individual authors and making your own decisions. But when you have somebody else's roadmap and they're leaving out key portions of history based on arbitrary reasoning in order to create a certain type of polity, it's something that you need to pay attention to.